Um, why preserve movies? I mean, stating the obvious, but I think there's really two components to it. One is a purely a commercial value, right? The, uh, the ability to uh, repurpose the movies across new channels um, from digital cinema all the way to streaming. Uh, but also movies of a very important cultural and historical importance. So preserving, mo making movies is hard. It's a work of art. Uh, it's very expensive and it's time consuming and preserving it is really important. So why IMF? IMF. So IMF, the interoperable master format. Just out of curiosity in the room, quick show of hands, who, have, who has never heard of IMF before? <laughs> Please don't be shy. All right. So, so IMF, it's a component-based interchange format designed specifically for finished audio, audiovisual masters and high-quality masters. So that's why it seems to be a good candidate for uh, preservation uh, of audiovisual information. It's also a worldwide standard. Um, which is good for longevity. It's back published in 2013, so have a couple of years of experience uh, implementing it and deploying it. It's also based on really boring established technologies. That was one of the key design goals to not try to reinvent the wheel and use things that have been used successfully, in particular technologies that were successfully used in uh, uh, digital cinema before. So XML, uh, everybody's heard about it. MXF, broad, widely used in, again, digital cinema and broadcast. So again, the, the goal was to really not do anything uh, um, exciting just for the sake of being exciting. Um, it supports uh, today, and we'll see that in a few seconds, uh, a wide range of uh, uh, qual uh, image quality all the way to uh, 8K lossless. It's a flexible format, and that's important, again, for preservation. Today in the future, you can associate uh, together, synchronize together a broad range of uh, uh, essence, audio, video, of course, but also subtitles and captions and more in the future. Um, it has many applications today, so many profiles of IMF are um, targeting a particular domain of application. Um, some, of them, some of it directly, uh, directly uh, designed for cinema, application for cinema mezzanine. Uh, some of it more for broadcast, other for studio, uh, for studio um, distribution servicing. I think the, the key here that's actually not shown here is, again, in the context of preservation, some of those profiles or applications of IMF go all the way to lossless image preservation uh, using uh, JPEG 2000. Um, and the idea here, again, is all those applications of IMF share about 90% in common. So this is a slide that's, um, I guess, intended to both inspire but also maybe show my ignorance about preservation. I've tried to understand, you know, so part of the goal of this workshop is to not only understand how IMF can apply to preservation, but also what is preservation, right? And um, so I think there are um, two dimensions, at least, I could think of of preservation. One is what are we preserving, right? At what part of the process are we preserving the source master? Are we preserving the digital, uh, the digital distribution master? Or are we pre preserving the actual distributed material? And also, are we preserving for one year, 50 years? So I think what I'm personally hoping to understand or get out of this workshop and future workshop is really which part of this is IMF applicable to, which, which parts of this year we're interested in, we as in the community in general. So this is not mean. This is not meant to insult anybody. So hopefully, I didn't cause any like political incident. But uh, um, and really, again, the goal is at the end to say what is IMF missing, or maybe IMF is really the wrong tool. But I think the goal of today and future and future uh, workshop is to really try to explore this. These questions, uh, you know, and and by missing, it could be really a broad range of. It could be a, a technical issue, right? There's a particular uh, um, image resolution that's missing, right? Something very specific, but it can also be very, um, 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 something more um, operational. For instance, maybe there's just education, right? People have not heard of IMF or um, people have not heard of preservation. And so the goal is to bring those two to communities together. So today, um, workshop organized by uh, Siegfried Fossil, who you've probably seen for the past 15 minutes while he was trying to call me. So thank you very much, uh, Siegfried, for organizing this and all the speakers. So I'll let you introduce everybody, or maybe you've already done this. 
Uh, some very quick logistics. There's a coffee break at 2.45, back where you started, so all the way back down. Workshop ends at 5. Um, and also, please note that the event is being recorded for educational and archival purposes. And thank you very much for the folks in the back, uh, uh, Olaf, Stefan, and Fabian, Fabian for, uh, from um, Hauptschriftstadt uh, Universities for uh, offering to record this event. Um, and uh, thanks, yeah, and thanks. And uh, the coffee break is made possible by Deluxe also. That's, uh, that's kindly offered that. So thank you very much, Deluxe. A um, couple of other logistics. Um, so for q and I think we're going to use uh, slido.com. So that allows uh, questions to be asked on your phone. And uh, so I suggest everybody pull out their phone, go on the website slido.com, enter IMF. And so there's two advantages to that. So for folks that might not be very comfortable in English, that uh, really makes it a lot easier to ask questions. Mm -hmm. It also allows uh, folks to uh, thumbs up questions, right? So it shows like which questions are more interesting to the audience. So we're going to do a mix of the two. It, it, it actually works great, right? I, I thought it would be a disaster the first time I used this. But it, the quality of the question is really, it comes out really good, I think. So I really encourage everybody to try that when we come to a Q&A. And um, that's it. So I think uh, back to you, Siegfried. Okay. And sorry again for uh, being a little late here. Okay. Thank you very much, Pierre. So uh, I did not uh, introduce myself. So, <laughs> but nevertheless, I think uh, many people knows me. So I make it short. So uh, yeah. Um, I'm working uh, for Fraunhofer uh, for many years, and uh, probably you know me from <coughs> even from the digital cinema arena. And uh, of course, also in the IMF, I worked for a long time and uh, have now several positions. Uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to organize this workshop, and uh, uh, that so much attendance is here. Uh, I think we are sold out, and I think that's quite good. And we have a very dense schedule, so. Uh, to to have a look to it, so we are already behind our schedule. <laughs> so I think that's the issue if you have a, a, a French and a German guy organizing a workshop. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, but uh, as I said, we have uh, many presentations. Uh, we try to keep this short, so 15 minutes each. So uh, uh, I ask all speakers really to keep this uh, time because uh, we want to have at the end, of course, this uh, time for question and answers and also to uh, review a little bit what you have discussed. Uh, and as uh, Pierre already mentioned, uh, the focus is for sure not to repeat what IMF is, but more to focus on uh, how IMF can be used for archiving and uh, preservation purposes. And uh, so the, the real uh, question is uh, today, uh, what are the missing elements, or is IMF the right tool to use it, or do we need uh, something different? And uh, uh, as uh, Pierre mentioned, uh, we have uh, six presentations uh, in the beginning, and then a coffee break uh, uh, at 2.45 uh, for half an hour. <coughs> so you know all now the way uh, down and up, so mm -hmm. it's a little bit sport. Uh, I think uh, hopefully we, we can keep the time, but uh, I think it's, it's okay. Then uh, after the uh, coffee break, uh, we have two more presentations and uh, a panel uh, because we have so many interests also for, for speaking on this topic uh, that we thought uh, a panel might be a good choice uh, also to, to work on this topic. And then we conclude uh, with the final Q&A. Uh, here 45 is the adjournment, but I think we probably will need till 5. Okay, that's it. And uh, then I would directly hand over to Andy Miles. It's a pleasure for me that uh, Andy will give us an overview. I think uh, the uh, Academy was the first company who uh, made aware of the digital li dilemma and uh, what it means at the end uh, that uh, we have digital data and no film any longer. So uh, yeah, let me open the presentation and yeah. Welcome, Andy. Right. Thank you, Siegfried. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, Pierre, I'm not at all offended. Okay. 
any thinking about uh, preservation of movies is good thinking about preservation. All right, let's um, get calibrated here. All right, so I'm very pleased to be here, and uh, I hope to lay some groundwork uh, for the talks that follow mine, as well as to provoke questions from you all for later in the day. And there we go. All right, let's start with some context. So I can assume everyone here has heard of this publication. Uh, please raise your hand if you haven't. All right, you'll have to stay late. All right. uh, I'm one of the co-authors of, of the publication, but a lot of people worked on, on getting it done. So believe it or not, this 11-year-old report is still downloaded every day from the Academy's website, and it's accumulated a significant collection of citations in scholarly works and higher education curricula. Uh, the Chinese version is still coming, and the Hindi version was just released as an e-book uh, earlier this year. So the digital dilemma must still be a thing. So as a reminder, you know, for those of you that did read the report, the short story is that digital motion pictures require a much more proactive preservation scheme than photochemical film. And if you don't have substantial financial resources and highly trained technical staff, you're going to have a tough go of keeping your digital assets accessible. So the good news, the preservation cost differential between preserving film and digital content has significantly shrunk since the report was published. But as things stand today, you still have to perpetually take technical actions and spend money to preserve digital motion pictures. Technological obsolescence is not the archivist's friend. For the purposes of this workshop, I'll highlight two of the con report's consensus findings. So way back when, in 2007, this finding articulated the need for digital file format specifications that support long-term preservation. Characteristics of such a file format include industry-developed requirements, future-proofing, standardization by accredited industry standards development organizations, and publicly available reference implementations, preferably open source, to name a few. So I'm pleased to report that after only 12 years, we do indeed have a digital motion picture master file format suitable for final delivery and long-term archiving, the Academy Digital Source Master. It has all the characteristics I mentioned, but for a few pieces of standardized metadata. The ADSM is composed of SMPTE standards, and those standards will soon become international standards at ISO, and more on that in a little bit later. So I'll list a few of the more important features of the Academy Digital Source Master Format. It's a standard-based file format for delivery and long-term archiving. It contains master-level images and sound, so it's uncompressed. It supports any frame rate and any spatial resolution. It defines necessary metadata structures, transforms, and reference images for unambiguous image pipeline reconstruction and rendering, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And this last one is particularly interesting because the master level image quality isn't compromised by the target display parameters. Those of you that know about ASUS know what I'm talking about. All right, Bill, come on. Is it there? Yeah, it's <laughs> everybody, point at Bill. <laughs> All right, so you may be wondering why I'm talking about this at an IMF workshop. All right, well. The ADSM builds on IMF app number 5, ASUS, otherwise known as SMPTE ST2067-50. And IMF app 5 builds on a suite of ASUS standards, and if it's not clear by now, the underlying core technology is the Academy Color and Coding System, or ASUS. And this wouldn't be an Academy presentation without a little bit of an ASUS update. Uh, here's a few of the movies and TV shows that have been mastered uh, using, or shot and mastered using ASUS. You can go uh, to the link up there, and I'll pr make sure these slides are available afterwards so you don't have to take pictures or write down URLs. Lots and lots of shows of all genres, types, budget sizes are, are shot with ASUS. Uh, and also, uh, many of the companies uh, that are here at IBC and some in the room with us now are ASUS product partners, so they've committed to do high quality and consistent ASUS implementations. So please visit them uh, at their booths and ask about their ASUS implementations and how they can work for you and your projects. I'd also like to highlight that Avid recently joined the ASUS logo program, and that means more and better ASUS support in Media Composer and editing products from other manufacturers. All right, let's come back to the matter at hand. And that's IMF App 5 and what's inside. So inside the package, the final ASUS master files, and you can have multiple versions in there, and those are presented as uh, 
uh, MXF streams, so it's ST2065-4 frames wrapped up in, in uh, ST2065-5, which is the spec for how you drop those things into an MXF stream. You can have optional related metadata, uh, and that specifies the rendering components for the ACES frames, uh, potentially uh, customized looks through look modification transforms, and also mastering display metadata. Uh, all of these items are planned for standardization in the next version of ACES. Audio sound fields, so whether you've got straight wave or you're doing immersive sound fields. Other data essence, if you had it, have it, time text, 4D data. And optional target frames. Uh, these are TIFF files of rendered reference frames from your composition to validate the reconstructed pipeline, and I'll talk more about that in, in a bit. So let's get a little visual here. Uh, here, and some of you may have seen this before. This is the, uh, how ACES is mapped into uh, an MXF stream. It's basically you drop these constrained open EXR frames into the essence uh, slot, and for a longer stream, you have multiple frames, and you wrap all those up, and there's essentially an ACES stream. And now drilling down, we drill down, now we're going to come back up to the IMF App 5 packaging level. The MXF stream and the optional target frames are loaded up and put into the package. And that makes an IMF app number five package. That's all it takes. So moving along, the ADSM is really just a constrained app five package. All right, the constraints are a few pieces of, for the time being, non-normative metadata, the essential rendering information, and an optional look transform, modification transform. Those bits are dropped into a sidecar. Oh, sorry, wrong, wrong sidecar graphic. <laughs> all right, there we go. That's the right sidecar graphic. So they go inside the sidecar, and the sidecar is brought into the IMF uh, package, and voila, you have an Academy Digital Source Master Package suitable for delivery and archiving. Round of applause for that. <laughs> Thank you. A little gratuitous, yes, I know. So another way to look at an ADSM is through the imaging pipeline that's constructed from its contents. Okay, so the ACES image sequence is extracted from the M MXF stream. The look modification transform is constructed from the LMT metadata inside the package. The ACES output transform is selected based on the transform ID contained in the ADSM metadata. And the optional target frame is used to validate that pipeline reconstruction. And you have additional hints about the display configuration for the mastering from the dis mastering display metadata. And things get really interesting from a packaging perspective because quite often you have multiple versions at the master level. Some content doesn't lend itself to a single master and then you derive the SDR version, for example, from the HDR version. In some cases that does work. So you can see how an Academy Digital Source Master Package built as a constrained IMF App 5 package meets requirements for master level delivery and long-term archiving. So I'd like to return to the digital dilemma for a moment. Another key finding under design for low risk of technical obsolescence. <clears throat> if you have a copy with you, turn to page 53. Open source software. There's a large body of open source software being developed specifically for large data storage, storage problems. Now, the Academy has been contributing to open source projects for a very long time. We even launched a major open source effort uh, on our own, and you may have heard of it. It's called ASUS. And with a larger open source community in mind, last year we launched a major initiative designed to improve the health of the motion picture industry's open source ecosystem, and it's called the Academy Software Foundation. This is a one-year-old separate entity, so it's not part of the Academy, it's a standalone entity, that is the result of a two-year-long investigation by the Academy Science and Technology Council in collaboration with more than 50 technology leaders from around the industry. The Academy's name is on it, and that's a first because we've never lent our name to anything we don't fully control, but the Academy Board of Governors felt this was important enough to put the Academy's name on it. Now, it turns out that the open source software is used throughout motion picture the production, distribution, and archiving, and the collective community-driven development model turns out to be struggling a bit. So the Academy software mi mission is, and I quote, increase the quality and quantity of open source contributions by establishing a governance model, legal framework, and community infrastructure that lowers the barrier to entry for developing and using open source software. 
The Academy Software Foundation is a partnership between the Academy and the Linux Foundation. You've heard of the Linux operating system, right? Okay, so they also manage a lot of open source foundations, and we are the newest one uh, in their collection. And it's the perfect partner for the motion picture industry. As of now, the foundation has 15 premier members. That means they pay the most money and sit on the foundation's governing board. We have six general members. They pay less money but still have representation on the board. And four associate members, of which the Academy is the only one that has a seat on the board. But since our name is on it, well, that's, that's part of what we got. So I just want to be clear that if you are a software developer, you don't have to pay money. This is simply how we have the, um, uh, uh, the foundation and all of its infrastructure structure supported for the benefit of software engineers. And I think there's going to be some news this weekend about, about a couple of new members to the foundation. So these are uh, five projects of the 50 or 60 or so that we identified that have been accepted into the foundation to date. There are a number of open source packages supporting IMF out there, and it would be great to see those packages included in this collection. <laughs> Submitting a project to the Academy Software Foundation doesn't mean the current maintainers lose control. To the contrary, foundation projects get increased visibility, technical support for build environments, and perhaps most important, increased likelihood that more software engineers will work on your project, and that's all for free. Now, Siegfried asked me to cover workflows, uh, and I suppose that uh, the imaging pipeline reconstruction I talked about earlier can be considered a workflow, and I see that a few of uh, our subsequent speakers are going to be covering archival and preservation workflows in more depth later on in the workshop. So I'll just add one more slide to make a point. So for those of you who remember film, photochemical film, there were no workflows. The film negative was exposed, <coughs> developed, and printed, and that was it. In our digital world, Workflow design is not easy. Here's a workflow for a digital remastering and archiving case study that the Academy is working on. Actually, there are several of these flowcharts because we're evaluating film scanning parameters, grading choices for various display devices and dynamic ranges, and we're also exploring an immersive object audio-based mix. My point is, it's complicated. All right? So from an archiving perspective, how does one make it less complicated? And that's where we get to the open issues, or perhaps a roadmap for future work to be considered. Automation, that's at the top of my list. All right, you've got uh, only so many people, only so many hours in a day, so how do you have the machines do the work for you? So for ADS re rendering, perhaps it's just another transcode, another kind of IMF transcode, and there are plenty of tools out there that, that support that now. And something to consider for down the road, or maybe even today, Artificial intelligence for cataloging metadata and feature extraction. When you have gobs and gobs of content, it takes forever to get through it on, on your own basis. There's already some good work going on in that area. Output profile lists. I hope that gets talked about a little bit later. That's, uh, that goes along with IMF. It's the recipe to instruct uh, automation tools, uh, what to do with the IMF ingredients needed uh, to support the automation. Standardizing a LUT format, that factors in in a number of places, and I don't have time to talk about that today, but it supports OPL operators and simple look modification transforms uh, in the ASUS world. The Academy is, uh, I should say the ASUS project now, is working on a common LUT format uh, that will be a candidate for standardization called uh, CLF. And then a standardized carrier for production <coughs> metadata. You have to get the metadata into the, the final deliverable somehow. And if you have a standard metada metadata carrier, that makes it a lot easier. There's something new called AMF, or um, it used to be ACES Clip, but that's being worked on now. A couple more open issues. Normative metadata to make the ADSM a SMPTE standard. We're working on that now. And then, of course, ISO standardization of all the SMPTE standards mentioned here. Uh, I just want to take a minute and talk about uh, ISO standards uh, and TC36 cinematography. Uh, so while I have your attention, this is our industry's international standards body, which I chair, and some of my colleagues in the room here are with us, with us today, are delegates from their national standards bodies. So this is where we will achieve the goal of a globally accepted and standardized file format suitable for archiving. So if you don't already participate, Please contact your national standards body representatives to be sure your archiving interests are represented. And finally, some resources for you. Uh, you don't have to write these down. Uh, they will appear afterwards. So ASIS, uh, Academy Software Foundation, ISO TC36, 
IMF tool, an open source package, and then of course there's uh, ASUS Users Group Day on Monday, uh, starting at 10.30. And with that, I hope this provokes some work at this workshop. Back to you, CC. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Andy. I think one of the uh, uh, goals of this workshop is, of course, also to bring all uh, interested parties together and uh, to also uh, discuss what tools or what uh, activities are going on. And uh, I see there's a lot of things going on, and that's the reason why we made these two uh, workshops, one here in Europe and one in uh, US because uh, we believe we have to talk at the end, of course, with each other, and we have to, to bring this uh, together. And this brings me also to, to my presentation directly, because, uh, as Andy mentioned, uh, standardization is one uh, important topic. And uh, so also, of course, in Europe, we have some standardization activities, uh, uh, not only on ISO level or on national level, but also on... Uh, let's say, more uh, European level. And I will uh, show you at, in the next slides uh, some uh, activities on the uh, SEN standardization activity. So uh, for you who do not know what SEN is, SEN is a European standardization organization. So typically, uh, we have the national standardization bodies. We have the European standardization body, which covers more or less the European. Uh, countries. Uh, then we have ISO, which is a worldwide activity. And uh, some years ago, I think it was four or five years ago, uh, we already discussed with the European Commission uh, it is, uh, there is a need uh, for standardizing uh, long-term preservation format. And uh, as you know, also in Europe, it needs a long time till we start with this activity. But uh, in the meantime, we started with a TC457. TC means a technical committee with uh, uh, the number is 457. The goal is the preservation of digital cinema content. And uh, the task of this uh, European activity is to first uh, develop a, a standard, for a kind of preservation package. And I will go to this uh, more in deep to, to show you what this means. Not another format, but it's more an uber uber format, I would say, uh, because uh, it's more based on the practical use uh, in archives and uh, what should be preserved at the end. Then, of course, uh, a standard is good, but you all know uh, a standard itself is not self-explaining, uh, so you need some uh, technical report and guideline how to use the standard and uh, give some examples uh, what you want to do. And uh, similar to what uh, Andy described, of course, we want to have also a, a reference software for that kind of standard. Uh, because it's important uh, at the end to have open source software as a reference uh, uh, to see how this works. So uh, a little bit what, what is the goal of this standardization activity. The name is, is uh, defined. Uh, it's called the SEN Preservation Package for Digital Preservation of Cinematographic Work. It explains a little bit uh, the scope. So that means uh, uh, we see that uh, movie creation uh, becomes complicated more and more, and we need uh, a way to preserve uh, all of this material uh, at some point. Uh, so that means we want to define methods uh, to describe the structure of the package and the relationship of its components. And components in this way means uh, it might be uh, image sequences, it might be uh, uh, componentized packages like uh, TCP or DSM or uh, IMF, uh, it might be, uh, uh, let's say, AV video files, and all of this, uh, of course, at the end uh, is typically stored uh, in the archive and uh, has to be managed itself. And uh, we want uh, to define, of course, also uh, uh, an interoperable way how we can exchange that content between the archives, and so uh, at some point we will need uh, for sure some constraints uh, for this uh, package. Uh, what we also want to make sure is that we have some hash value calculation to ensure the data integrity. I think this is important for preservation of content, because at the end uh, you want to be sure that uh, 
your digital data uh, is preserved and you can uh, reuse it uh, uh, later on. And so we need also, of course, a syntax for embedding the hash values and the methods for the hash values. So uh, for what is this send preservation good and for what is it not? Uh, first of all, we want to use it for exchange of digital content. It can be either scanned material or digital born content. It should be a kind of self-contained package uh, for uh, storage of cinematographic works uh, on files or tapes. So it's, it is a little bit oriented to uh, the uh, uh, open archival information system, but uh, it is more a submission information package for such a kind of uh, system. It defines not the uh, archival information package itself because this is uh, more a, a, a topic of the, uh, uh, let's say, uh, systems itself. Uh, we want uh, to make sure that we uh, can also store, uh, let's say, different metadata. Uh, we define not the database, but we want to make sure that we can uh, uh, put this uh, metadata into the package. And what is the, the most important topic of all, we do not want to reinvent existing formats like TCP or IMF or uh, MXF uh, because this makes no sense. I think it's more important to see how we can structure these formats uh, uh, and put this together in this uh, uh, send preservation package. So this is uh, quite abstract, but um, we discussed this with uh, several archives in Europe, uh, how this uh, can be managed and of course at the starting point is typically we have uh, in an archive and working folder. So that means you create content or you manage content uh, in an archive and uh, of course you create uh, either DCP or you, you create an IMF. And uh, at the end uh, if you have all of your content uh, stored in your uh, system you want to, to put this in, in one let's say structure. And this is the send preservation package. And uh, at the end, uh, of course, this send preservation package as a, a complete package should be put on an archive system uh, and uh, put on the shelves on LTO or whatever to preserve it for, for a long time. So uh, where are we now uh, in the moment? As I said, we started this activity four, years, four, four or five years ago. And uh, the real work started end of last year. So that means uh, it needed a long time till the tender and all of this uh, bureaucratism uh, worked. Uh, but uh, today we are uh, at a, a working draft level, so uh, uh, we will publish the first working draft uh, uh, officially on mid of October, end of October. And uh, we will have, of course, an inquiry phase for the committee draft and uh, all of these other stages at the end. So. Uh, Standardization is not easy, and of course, uh, most standardization work is done on a voluntary basis. But in this specific case, uh, we have also a project team uh, uh, who is financed by the European Commission uh, to work on this uh, activity. So uh, I myself am the project team leader, and we have Daniel Bornstein, Hans Nicola, uh, uh, Jörg Kuppert, Lars Carlson, and, and Heiko on the, this team who. Uh, discuss and work on this uh, working draft and software uh, topics. At the end, of course, it's like a typical standardization activity. Uh, it goes to uh, uh, the CEN uh, standardization committee and uh, then the European uh, countries can uh, comment on this and, and, and uh, want to make uh, modifications. So uh, we looked also, of course, what we have as an input and uh, we try to, to collect all potential formats which we want to reuse. So of course, uh, as I said, uh, we want not to, to define DCP or another IMF or another uh, ACES uh, standard. So we want to use it and, and, and put it together. Uh, and we also, of course, uh, looked to the European standards for, for metadata uh, for cinematographic works. We already had some which are used by the European archives. And uh, of course, we also want to put this into this topic. Uh, what we also did uh, in uh, this project is we made a questionnaire uh, amongst the European archives. So we uh, asked 88 institutions in uh, Europe. I will not show the complete uh, results of the questionnaire here, only to give you a, an idea 
uh, what uh, we will have uh, asked. Uh, and uh, uh, we will publish this uh, results uh, later on. But uh, in, at the end, we had 31 uh, uh, answers uh, from the uh, European archives. And uh, many of these European archives, of course, uh, do also legal or contractual deposit on this content. Uh, also here, a little bit an idea what they uh, preserve or archive uh, in their uh, uh, systems. So typically, for if you looked for raw scans uh, of film material, you see typically TIFF or DPX, that's the most important, but we also see some other uh, formats. Uh, uh, so uh, it's a lot of different uh, things which uh, will be stored. For the finalized post-produced or restored content, uh, uh, we see that uh, we have also DPX and TIFF uh, image sequences, We have, uh, but also ProRes files, we have also DCDMs, we have also DSMs and DCPs. So there are a lot of different uh, variations of formats. And uh, that brought us to an idea how would we organize uh, such kind of send preservation package? And this is only a, a, a simple part uh, of this send preservation package. We said, okay, at the end, uh, of course, everything should be one big package. And we will have uh, a send packing list which uh, describe what we have inside this uh, uh, complete package. It's uh, a kind of hierarchical structure, so that means uh, we go down to the uh, directory tree uh, and also have uh, different other packing lists because we do not want to create uh, all hash values of all of the uh, uh, parts of the tree uh, again and again. If we add some uh, new elements, then we want uh, uh, to uh, only uh, change the uh, top level packing list and not the complete uh, package itself. So, uh, but uh, let's have uh, a look to this. Uh, this is a so-called uh, full standard referenced asset bin package. So that means uh, uh, here we have very uh, separated elements uh, and the separated elements are, are images itself. So we have image uh, sequences, we have uh, sound files, we have time text files. Uh, so that's uh, the, the basic uh, elements uh, we have. Uh, put together in packing lists uh, and then also put together in playlists and uh, uh, bin packing lists. As I said, uh, this is uh, uh, one pass. Uh, we also have other passes. So if you look to this, uh, asset componentized packages. So that means here we uh, see as a, a, a subfolder, uh, for example, a DCP or a, a IMF or an uh, componentized uh, package which uh, already is for uh, itself uh, self-contained. So because then, of course, we do not need uh, separated images anymore. We have it already uh, uh, combined together. And uh, so uh, we will store here this also in, in this uh, uh, tree element. Uh, and uh, then we have also the, the uh, so-called uh, AV uh, packages. In many archives, uh, we have already uh, compiled, let's say, the images to an uh, MPEG-4 file or to an MXF file, uh, but maybe not uh, to a, a complete uh, DCP or IMF package. And that's the reason why we have here also subfolders for sys uh, elements, and uh, then also for, for extra packages. So uh, we have created this on a, on a big mind map, and uh, as I said, uh, it's only a very uh, part of this uh, uh, big mind map and uh, uh, we will for sure uh, publish this mind map so that you can have a look to what uh, are the individual elements uh, look like and what we want to use. What is also important, which is not shown here, is uh, as I said, uh, this uh, first elements are full standard referenced uh, elements. We see also that we have many elements uh, today which will be archived which are not full standard uh, referenced. Uh, so maybe uh, it is on the way, like for example ProRes, or even it's not on the way, uh, it's, it's more proprietary. But uh, in any case, also the archives want to store such kind of elements and uh, do not want to throw it away. And that's the reason why we have also uh, 
same uh, folders uh, in the same structure for this uh, not uh, standard referenced elements. At the end, of course, we need some uh, either uh, industrial uh, standard specification or or some some recommendations, uh, but uh, we have to store this at the end also in this uh, send preservation package because uh, we want to preserve as much as possible. Uh, it might happen that, uh, of course, only the full standard reference parts are can be restored in 50 years uh, or 100 years, but uh, you know today uh, uh, many uh, workflows are, are based on some specific proprietary formats which are not completely standardized, but uh, we want to preserve this also. Okay, that's a little bit an overview of this uh, uh, topic. Uh, as I said, uh, we have this mind map uh, and originally I planned to show this mind map more in detail, but I think because of the time uh, we skip this and I, I can, uh, uh, let's say, offer to, to, to publish this mind map so that you can have a look to it for this. Okay, and that's my presentation. Thank you. So then going to the next uh, presentation. The next presentation is uh, from Simon. Uh, as I said, uh, I think uh, for the preservation packages, many uh, questions are of course uh, raised and uh, also uh, answered by uh, European archives. And that's the reason why we also invited uh, uh, archives to this uh, workshop and uh, at the end, we have two archives uh, or people who are working uh, together with archives here. One is uh, from uh, CNC, the French uh, organization, and uh, the other one is from the Swedish Film Institute, and Simon will explain a little bit what they think about the archive topic and how IMF might be useful for them. Hello. Hello. So my name's Simone. Oh, maybe I need to put that a bit down. Okay. So my name is Simone Appleby, and I am from the CNC. Um, so for some of you who don't know what the CNC is, the CNC is the Centre National Cinématographique. It leads a public policy in the sectors of film and audiovisual production, under the director and under the direct authority of the Minister of Culture. It proposes and applies regulations listed within the French, French Film Industry Code and manages operating licenses, film classifications, and more. So like I said, I'm Simone Appleby. I'm from the archive section, which is called Département du Patrimoine, and I manage the photochemical and digital restoration lab. So this presentation is mainly to introduce you to who we are, and also to talk a little bit about the birth of IMF 4, application 4. So I'm going to just briefly present to you our film heritage department and then um, push on to why we wanted an IMF application 4. So in a nutshell, our archive was created in 1969 by the then cultural minister André Malraux. Um, this year it's our 50th anniversary. Um, over the years, we have voluntary and legal deposits, and we have up to 140,000 titles today in our collection. We're 35 minutes outside of Paris. We are the third largest archive in the world behind Library of Congress and also Goss Film Fund. We have a digital and photochemical lab. Our digital lab has two and a half scanners. Half scanner because one of the scanners is a Bayer, so I wouldn't really call it a scanner, but we use it just for um, to be able to visualize things on a, on for, one, for one screening or just to have a look at films um, briefly or to use it as an EDL. So as you can see, you, over the 140,000 titles, we have um, restored 16,000 films photochemically and about 13,000 films have been digitized. So we have a long way to go. On to the next slide. So if you're going to see a few samples now from our collection. Again, this is I don't. We, 
images are going to pop up and down on the screen just so that you can have a look. We have over 50 different formats and various procedures. So I'm not going to show you all of those for you today. The last two pictures you are going to see on this screen is an 85 millimeter film from Marais and also a film from Lumière in 1900, which is a 75 mil. So you can deduce from these films that are over 100 years old, if film is stored in the right conditions, it's well preserved. And this last film, you'll be able to see it for those who will be going at the Lumière Festival in Lyon. It will be screened for the first time. So just before I go on to why we pushed for an IMF application for, I think it's also important that you know that the CNC also has a Film Heritage Commission in which we fund films, and um, we have funded 1,161 films for 66 million since 2012. Um, the, main the main reason for this, uh, there are three main uh, reasons for this. Uh, I think I've just, sorry. <coughs> need to go back one slide. I pressed the wrong button. Can I go back one slide? Yes. Okay. So we have three objectives on this commission. The three objectives is to help enrich the selection of films available legally online. It's also to ensure that the heritage of films are preserved and passed down to future generations. And it's also to enable films to be shown on the technology today. Now, one of the things that are very important when we, res when we give these funds is that the films that are restored are filmed out on polyester. Films that are over, that were shot from 1999 onwards are not shot on polyester, but we need a digital equivalent as a, as a mid-term to long-term preservation. Um, one thing to note also is that within the budgets that we give, um, the CNC attributes around 70% of the budget for restoration, and the distributor, producer, or right holders are also to, to contribute to the rest of the budget. Now, 66 million is a lot of money, so the CNC is, of course, very interested that should film preservation eventually disappear, there will be a digital equivalent. Now, back in 2011, no one knew for how long film would be available. Film and digital labs in Paris were going bankrupt one by one. There was one particular film lab that had 40 films in production. Already file exchange between labs can be difficult. You don't know necessarily what color <coughs> space are DSMs. So we wanted a file that would be easy of exchange and also a file that could contain all the different asset manager, all the different assets that you would need. Now, it's also important to know how do you exchange a file if a lab has gone bankrupt with films in production. So that was one of the reasons that the CNC was keen to, to have a digital format. I pressed the wrong button again, sorry. So at that point, the CNC contacted the CST and the FICAM in order to define a single digital file format that could enable efficient exchange between post houses, distributors, and that could contain all assets in one package, original scans, raw files, graded finals, sounds, subtitles, and captioning. This package would then be made as a master for all versions for middle to long-term production. As we tend to use scans also from 4K to 8K 16-bit files, we needed a file that would also have minimum compression, so lossless, of course, was preferable. We needed a similar file or package structure like an IMF application too, that could also enable different frame rates, bit rates, codecs, definitions, and color spaces. So the CST worked during two years to define a digital package and a further four years to standardize through SMPT, what's now called IMF4. A technical recommendation for industry professionals called the RT021 was also published. Unlike open source files, like, we did, like Siegfried just mentioned, standardized means it becomes an industry standard with technical specs that need to be respected, which is why also we pushed for a standardization. 
So is IMF4 used widely today? Well, the simple answer to that question is no. Although SIMT have recognized the format and standardized it at the request of the CST, unfortunately the final implications of that means that not all distributors, holders of copyright or producers make them. Also, Baselight and Blackmagic, who are the main finishing softwares that post-production houses use today, haven't yet implemented it into their, integra integrated it into their system. Um, Marquis Technology, Colorfront, Clips to have, so thank you very much to those that have followed us on this. Also, um, the, the CNC, to be able to push for IMF4, the CNC have a financial aid in which they now ask that IMF4 be used as a preservation in the preservation contract. If the producers decide on, on a digital format, the CNC asks that the producers follow the RT043 technical recommendation published by the CST, which largely advises the use of this IMF4. So across the Atlantic, I spoke with a few colleagues who work in LA, and from what I'm hearing, the main preservation that's used right now is separation masters, but also LTOs, and, return, and also single strip film out. IMF4 is not used, though IMF2 and IMF2E, I've heard, are. So in conclusion, well, as you saw in my first slides, we know we have films from over 100 years old, and so the CNC will prioritize film out as a preservation master, but we do want to be able to use more and more digital files today. So the industry, also CNC, has helped, uh, begun to bring out uh, an aid which will help equip film labs based or post-production houses based in Paris who want to be able to equip and using new materials or have the software, there'll be a subvention aid to help them do that. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Yeah, thank you, Simone. And we are directly switching to the next uh, archive. Uh, the next archive uh, will be the Swedish Film Institute. And it's uh, a pleasure to uh, have Pierre Legilius uh, here from the Swedish Film Institute, and he will explain us a little bit more about the uh, current workflows uh, in this public archive. Yeah. Thanks. Yes, hi. Uh, I'm Per Legilius, and I work at the Swedish Film Institute, and I'm also the film archive representative in the TC457 that Siegfried was talking about earlier. So, about the Swedish Film Institute, uh, we're about 130 people and we uh, work to promote and fund Swedish film and also to collect, preserve and give access to the Swedish film heritage. And the funding part and the collecting part are tied together in, by, our, by the contractual deposits that we, for the, uh, so for the films that we fund, uh, producers are obliged to to bring in the contractual deposit which builds up our archive. Uh, at the moment we have around 25,000 titles in our collections. Uh, most of those are analog. Uh, our digital archive only have about 1,500 titles so far, so we're, but it's constantly growing. Uh, we also have a photochemical lab uh, back in 2011, when the last big commercial lab in Sweden closed, we bought up the equipment and hired <coughs> some of the staffs that were working at the lab uh, and uh, started our, to, to keep this knowledge of the photochemical lab going. And uh, the staff that was hired from the lab have now retired and younger persons have taken over, so we're keeping this knowledge alive. Uh, we have been, we have started our digital archive in 2012 and this coincided uh, partly with, with the analog lab closing of course but also since there was also the time in Sweden when 
all uh, cinemas went digital. So uh, post-production had been done digitally for a few, good few years, but uh, the only thing analog left was the, the screening and distribution. When that closed down, uh, no one was working with film anymore. And the, the, what we had as contractual deposit up to then was film, an intermediate positive that uh, uh, producers should uh, deliver to us. So we thought then a good thing to start uh, accepting things digitally instead. Uh, we started our digitize, digitizing our own film collection in 2013 as a natural of having a digital archive. We then uh, started digitizing and restoring. So we, and it was a good idea to, to do it in that order. Uh, so we had our platform for archiving first. Uh, so, this is our process then, uh, in digitization and archiving. Uh, we had in-house equipment and staff, 12 persons. We decided to do the whole chain ourselves, from scanning, all, all the way from scanning uh, down to the uh, actual tape library. Uh, we invited the industry to to uh, to join, but they weren't that focused on on this at the time. Uh, post production companies were closing down uh, uh, back in 2012, 2013. Uh, we digitize and restore up to 70 titles a year uh, ourselves, and th that will we will bring about four man weeks of work into each title. Uh, 4K scanning, uh, color grading for cinema, uh, restoration, a semi-automated restoration process. And same for audio, we, we record audio from optical or magnetic uh, soundtracks and, and uh, sync and, and restore together with the image. So those are about 70 titles a year. Then we have uh, received an archive of about 400 contractual deposits each year. Uh, these are very, very much in the t terms of file formats and, uh, and a quality based on that we have very uh, wide range of subsidies that we give. We can give 1 million euro for the uh, funding of a big Swedish f full feature film and we can give 5,000 euros for a uh, small uh, short subject. So for the full feature film, we would require DPX uh, files, uncompressed masters. And for a, the, the short file, the short film, we would uh, settle for a progress. Uh, to archive everything, we have two uh, mirrored tape libraries running Diva Archive, uh, Content Storage Manager. Uh, Diva Archive was a company called Front Porch Digital that were bought up by Oracle and now is again is a, in a new uh, company called Echo Digital, I think. Uh, works very well for us. Uh, and we do a migration of uh, uh, every five years, depending a little bit of, of our tape technology. And we did a migration last year uh, of both our libraries and we had zero read errors, which we were very happy about. So, Choosing an archive format. Uh, when we started out planning for this seven years ago, uh, we had to do a bit of, of planning. Uh, being an archive, we had to be compatible with what people sent us at the time. We had to be open for the future, but we also had to look like 100 years back uh, for our own collection. So we wanted an archive format that, that could uh, suit us in that way. Uh, we looked at what file formats were out there at the time and, and uh, we and we reckoned we would get uh, DPX files, TIFF files, WAV files for the uncompressed part. We would get DCPs and ProRes and, this, and uh, also produce ourselves from our own uh, scanning and, and restoration and that proved to be pretty dead on what we also got. So this is what we get seven years later also. DPX, TIFF, ProRes DCPs. 
for uh, DCPs, you have a very good system of uh, hash and uh, hashing hash values. You have uh, a standardized or, or open formats and stuff like that. For uh, uncompressed DPX and TIFF files, uh, we needed something that we could use to, to pack this together and, and have hash values and, and <coughs> things like that. And one thing that we early on uh, was discussing was the fact that our resolutions can be very non-standard. So if, for, for example, a scanned <coughs> image uh, uh, that we scan with our film scanner could look like this. We have a 4.3K resolution uh, horizontal and almost 4K in, um, in vertical resolution. This is to, uh, in this case, we also have captured, we scan, scanned the whole image to be able to even capture the audio from the image scanner, which we do with the software. And, uh, and also the, our image restorers want to have all the way out to the purple so they can do stabilization and stuff like that. And so this image needs to be, this resolution needs to be archived. And then we decided never to do any scaling because we do not want to conform to current standards when we do our restoration work. So what we do is that we crop our way to our final output. So our digital restoration will have this resolution, which is uh, very much non-standard. But uh, we do not want to scale this down to the current 4K standard or place it in a much too large 8K container. So this is the, the, um, the, the, the output from our restoration. So to sum up then a little bit about choosing an archive format, uh, we wanted uncompressed or mathematically lossless compression. We wanted to use any bit depth, any resolution and aspect ratio. We wanted open file formats and we wanted calculated hashes and we wanted a playable object. So we wanted to have something that you can open and get instantly get image from, not, not having it tarred or zipped or anything. We wanted it as, to the, as this. Uh, so at the, at the time then we were presented with Fraunhofer's uh, MAP master archive package, which suited our needs perfectly. And uh, so the master archive package is JPEG 2000 lossless at any resolution, aspect ratio, bit depth. It's a J2C code stream. It's wrapped in MXF. And you can, uh, the audio is optional. You have optional uh, PCM audio. You do not have, for example, for raw scans, you do not have any audio. But uh, so we don't have to like create placebo empty audio containers. We can just do an MAP with just image in it. And it's calculated hash values. And you have the usual asset map PKL and support for multiple CPLs. And as you can see, this is very close to a DCP or IMF. You can call it IMF-ish if you like. Uh, uh, so we, this format has suited us really well. And we've been using it for the last seven years now. And we have this for all our raw scans, all our masters uh, in our archive. Uh, the cons the, uh, of, of using this format, well, for in the beginning, uh, rendering to JPEG 2000 lossless was a, definitely an issue. Uh, 2K was slow, 4K was unthinkable. Uh, since then, we have gotten more and faster workstations, so it's not an issue really anymore. I think I render 4K uh, from, from uncompressed scanner files at about 8-10 frames per second now, which is totally okay. We're an archive. We're not that pressed for time. Uh, <laughs> we don't need real time. Uh, and the other, of course, uh, big con is that uh, we're the, like the only ones using it. So uh, we're a bit alone. But so um, Fraunhofer has a, we use a special license of ECDCP creator to create these packages. And uh, I think that we're pretty much the only ones, but uh, Fraunhofer kindly uh, has the support for MAP still in, in all latest revisions. And of course, it's not standardized. So um, uh, uh, that's it's interesting to be here in the IMF user group. So to see if, if there's any interest of like making this into an application maybe. 
think about it. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>
So you are sure that you are not missing any portion of metadata when you move a film content from a film archive to the other or from a digital library to the other. You need some standardized um, pattern that is consistent over time, something that you can restore 10, 15, 50 years from now and be sure that you also get the metadata that are so important because when we scan a movie, when we restore a movie, we have a unique opportunity. We have the opportunity to gather information about uh, a movie that's long gone in the past. So uh, the people who store and handle and visually uh, handle frame by frame of the, of the continent movie have the unique opportunity of gathering information from archives, from historical records, from preservationists, from scholars, and put them all together to check and check if those data are true, collate together, and translate into a metadata file. And scanning and restoration phase is the unique opportunity to have a, a logical link between the audio and video content and those metadata. You also need to make the assumption that that might be, that that might be the last opportunity to do this. Because when a, a better scanning technology is born, you might not have funding to do the rescan. And even if you have funding, you might not have the digital film anymore because the film archive doesn't have the, 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 the original celluloid any, any longer, possibly because the film was destroyed during the, the last scan. Sometimes it happens. So you need to make sure when you scan a movie that gathering those metadata might be the last opportunity you have to do that. So uh, in the most important thing is having a file format that allows you to store the metadata, the preservation metadata, along with content, make sure that nobody will get lost in the future. IMF. Uh, IMF has uh, uh, two ways to do that, actually. One opportunity is using the so-called sidecar composition map, which is a standard XML component uh, that is optional uh, in current IMF packages. The SEM component is just an XML file, so you can embed in, in, with it a schema coming from any other XML file that stores metadata about a, a film. So you can just take your old XML metadata file and embed into an SCM file. The other uh, component you have is the isochronous stream of XML documents, which is uh, currently just a little bit uh, uh, to become a real standard in SMT, uh, is in the RDD stage. Uh, we'll talk about this later on. So the sidecar composition map uh, is uh, the ideal uh, component to store those metadata that relate to the composition as a whole. So uh, not just technical metadata, I'm speaking about uh, historical and cultural, uh, artistic financial metadata as well about the movie. So synopsis, history, full crew, um, <coughs> version information, des description of the restoration plan, uh, everything that might be useful 15, 20, 50 years from, from now. Um, if we map this to modern studio content, the SCM might also store information about the original digital cameras that were used during the movie. Um, so one file that contains all the metadata related to, to the global composition. Um, the file can also store information like the uh, digital position and the description of the kinds of soundtracks you have from a scanned film. So if you have multiple soundtracks, you might describe uh, digitally where to find the soundtracks. Uh, other information you might store are the, cal the scanner calibration information parameters. They might be useful at a later time uh, if you do advanced color imaging. <coughs> the second component where you can store this metadata is the ISXD. The ISXD, for those who don't know what it is, is just uh, basically a subtitle track. It works more or less like that. So it's an MXF file that wraps inside possibly many XML files all pertaining to the same schema. These XML files can be associated to just a portion of the timeline, like a scene, a cut, even a single frame. So the ISXD is the ideal component to store uh, metadata like frame geometry and tracking, like preservationists' notes, uh, like film defects. For example, we can use it to store a running track containing time code running UUIDs from digital files or key code from, from scans. We can use it to store a scene-based list of actor's name versus character's name. Uh, if you watch a movie on, on Amazon Video, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, along with the position where their faces are, 
uh, if you do this kind of job on a frame by frame basis when you do the scan, uh, that's the perfect occasion to gather those metadata and put them on files. Uh, you can also store the resolution of the active frame of the movie. My colleague uh, who talked before uh, described exactly the situation. You need to preserve the whole scan perf to perf, interline from interline, but still you, you want to know which is the area that a, a viewer is likely to watch when if he sees the movie on theater. Um, if the film is badly damaged, you want to store uh, a geometric information of where film defects are. That geometric information is used during the restoration. And if you store that, for example, embedding uh, vector data in an, in an SVG-like pattern inside the XML, you can use later on. Possibly you don't have funding to restore, to fully restore the movie now, but when you restore the movie, you can still keep track of those information which might be later used to know where the original frame defects used to be before the restoration phase. So it's all metadata that you can either store them or never more in the future. Um, the SCM component and the ISXD component are part of the IMF package structure. So any IMF aware application we likely validate the package and be sure that if an SCM file is supposed to be there because it's referenced into the PKL, it should be there. Otherwise, the IMF package raises an issue. So uh, we use IMF standard uh, ways of working to, to understand if the, the package is self-complete. If it misses some metadata, a, a warning will be raised. The ISXD components can be used for versioning. I will tell you this in a, in a few moments. Um, but most importantly, if you take the archival file a few years from now to do, for example, a localized version of your content, uh, for example, you just want to add some titles, uh, it's irrelevant if your subtitling application understands or not uh, the film scanning parameters into the ISXD. It doesn't matter. Your subtitling application is just an IMF compatible subtitling application. So if you generate another IMF out of that with new subtitles, the metadata will still be there because the application will take the file and move it to the other file. So it doesn't need to be completely aware of every restoration workflows. Um, the second problem we have is that, uh, as my colleague briefly mentioned, we sometimes have to deal with exotic frame file, frame format, or soundtrack formats that are not uh, compatible with today's uh, standards. Um, Frame per file formats like DPX, for example, have the problem that they lack a standard. Uh, we are at most have best practices to, to associate metadata with content. But uh, uh, they lack uh, uh, many other features for restoration. The digital cinema-based formats, DCDM and DCP, are constrained because they were designed for the theatrical screening, not for the preservation. So they are constrained for resolution, for film speed, for number of sound channels. Uh, they have a, a not mathematically lossless compression. Uh, they have an output referred colorimetry. Uh, so they are suboptimal formats uh, uh, for archival, especially DCP. We all know that DCPs are used as archival formats, but uh, uh, it's not about the optimal format. Uh, for example, if we do a 4K scan, full app of a, of a legacy movie, and we, we need to do a DCDM or DCP standard out of that, and we need to stick with the standard, the best option to stick with the standard is downsize the movie, fit it in a flat screen, which means uh, res downsizing the raster, and then pillar boxing it, which means wasting 37% horizontally of the screen. So you're paying for a 4K scan, and all you get if your archive is in DCP is a 2.8 raster, which is uh, uh, suboptimal. And I'm not even commenting about uh, uh, the case you have uh, uh, non-standard frame rates, which is uh, uh, happening sometimes. Uh, single file formats like MP4, MXF, and Matroska are very good uh, formats because they support many codecs uh, and many metadata. You can stick whatever resolution, whatever codec, and whatever metadata inside, and all you get in the end is a single file, which is good for packaging. But uh, still, there are utmost best practices on how to use codecs inside an MXF file, on how to write metadata in the file in a way that is interoperable with future applications. 
So uh, if you use this format, um, it is good, but it might not be future-proof. So uh, in this case, for this particular kind of problem, IMF is the ideal format because it, uh, it doesn't have constraints of this sort. It's not constrained as regards resolution, it's not constrained as regards frame rate, sound format, uh, it's not constrained regards the metadata you put. The third problem is, uh, uh, is well known to those who handle studio content and make many versions out of a, of a blockbuster movie. Uh, but we have that in film restoration projects. Just think of a movie which is uh, coming from a <coughs> nitrate black and white scan, but then you also find out uh, with, with intertitles in the original language. But you might also find later on a, a hand-painted print version that you want to rescan. Then you possibly want to version the content because you add intertitles in another language, more, more than one language possibly. And, uh, uh, of course, you just scan the intertitles, or you create fr from scratch new intertitles. You have sound, possibly <coughs> mute films might have a piano recording. And then, of course, you add a few dubbings, because cause you, want to you might want to version your original content. And, of course, lots of subtitles and closed captions. And the ISXD tracks containing all the preservationist metadata. If we archive all these different versions, uh, old style, we would need a render for each combination of those audio video subtitle essence, which means version IDs. Net it, this name was invented by Netflix a few years ago, and it perfectly characterizes that this as an illness. Uh, this is particularly important to film archives that might not have that expensive storage available. Just think of a movie which might take five, six terabytes per movie, multiplied by ten versions, of course, the componentized workflow enabled by IMF may help, because in this case, you can create uh, an original version IMF, which contains your basic scan, and all the later versions you have will just contain the differentials of the original version. So, for example, a version which, has just, which is different from the original just because of the English intertitles, just because the audio and the subtitles in different language, will just be a few hundreds of megabytes large. Of course, to play it back, you need to have also the original version, but at least you don't have twice the storage footprint. Uh, a version that only contains uh, subtitle tracks is only a few kilobytes larger than the original. And the more versions you have, uh, the less storage footprint you have, because the more version you have, there's a, uh, I'm not showing this, but there's a, a logarithmic curve. More versions you have of the content and, lo and less uh, storage uh, your, 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 your footprinting. So, um, IMF is the ideal pattern also for this problem. Well, today um, we have IMF applications. Some of them are good and some of them are less good for uh, preservation of content. Uh, Andy Maltz introduced the ADSM, which is a constrained app number five uh, uh, IMF, which is ideal for studio content and might also be ideal for film source content. Um, well, uh, in my opinion, we need an application, a new IMF application for film preservation. W of course, there is app number four, which is good, uh, but we need an application that also supports uh, scanning from perforation to perforation, that also supports supplemental versioning, that also supports uh, embedding the metadata inside. It might be an extension of app number four. It might be an extension of app number five. Um, if there are at least two companies today here that might be interested in, in becoming SMT proponents of the standard, uh, I'd be happy to join and to, to help in becoming uh, proponents for, uh, so this becomes a new IMF application, it's particularly suited and tailored to IMF workflow. So basically uh, I'm done and that's my email over there. If you need any question, just ping me a note. Thanks. Yeah, Walter, thank you very much uh, for your in-depth presentation. I think this was very helpful to explain a little bit the issues uh, which we also have with the uh, digitization of uh, content and not only with the digital porn content. And now, before we go to the coffee break, 
I know you are all waiting for this, but I'm, I'm pretty sure Lawrence will make this exciting. Yeah. So. Yeah. Thank you, Siegfried. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, just very briefly uh, about uh, Marquis Technologies. So we develop software for the mastering and QC uh, of IMF, of course, all applications, but not only DCP, but very few know that we've started with the archive industry because our first product was the telecinet uh, transcoder. So when we started, with our first customer. It was an Italian archive. Um, at that time, they were only receiving, receiving film rolls. Um, obviously, this has changed a lot because now they also need to receive, uh, as you said, digital bond content. So for the most part, it is IMF, uh, sorry, it is DCP, but um, they are also receiving IMF. So no matter what they decide for the archival, the internal archive format, the most important is what they need to receive. Uh, they have to be prepared to store and preserve that content. Um, many times they also dif receive different versions of the same title. Uh, I come from Switzerland. The National Archive uh, have the um, obligation to preserve every type of uh, content that has been showcased in Switzerland, including the different language versions. So they keep DCP French, DCP English, DCP German, subtitles in Italian. So that makes a lot also for uh, a digital format. Um, and as Siegfried shown, uh, archiving are receiving and storing IMF as well. So it is an opportunity to understand uh, how this format can really help in different um, workflow of the, of the archives. If you just think about accepting IMF in an archive, there's a minimum to uh, support. This minimum is at least the playback of the package because you need to see what's inside. And the second thing is the uh, indexation of the content. So basically, you want to have that information into your catalog. So to do that, you need to at least have a tool and you need to have uh, trained people, people that do understand the complexity of a component-based package. Since you do that, why not doing a little more? So leverage on what you've done so far just to be able to receive an IMF package and store it, but why don't you use it to do much more. And the much more was using what is interesting in the IMF. I don't want to go over that. It has been uh, already uh, said earlier, but it's a high quality final <coughs> digital master and it stores assets and it has a playlist for the content, which is the most important here. The only uh, second very important thing is the sidecar uh, file capability. Metadata, descriptive, Technical are carried with the assets. You can carry QC reports, you can carry movie extras, I'm talking about posters, scripts, those kind of things. So these capabilities in your current workflow, one of the main workflow of archive, digitization. So we're coming from film, we're going to digital. Um, this, based on our experience with some customers, they do uh, digitize their film rolls, they use a scanner. Um, if they do not have in-house capability, they uh, work with partners, post-production companies. And when they, what they receive from the scan is a disk, hard disk drive, with a lot of files inside. Um, best case, DPX files. Um, audio might be present as well, and uh, EDL, if any, and maybe some instructions by email or text file inside the disk drive of uh, what's inside um, my drive. Thing is, how do you reassemble the content? And there is a bit of issues here that um, uh, cannot be uh, well addressed with this current workflow. When there's an EDL present, 
uh, there's some limitations around it. The first one is archival frameworks are not supported by the EDL. The second thing is um, there's different behavior of how uh, software is interpreting the EDL. So you can't base uh, really, you can't, you can't be assured that every software you use now or tomorrow will uh, interpret the, the EDL the same way. Real ordering. Um, that, that I found, uh, I had a customer, they, uh, were, they, they retrieved uh, film rolls uh, without any sticker on the box. So they had no idea of the um, timing of the film rolls. So the reels ordering is also extremely important in, in the archiving world. Thing is, the other, another issue is the uh, timing. Um, when you do uh, uh, the scanning, you may have a different process for audio. Um, comes from a different workflow. And the thing is, the issue here is how do you synchronize back uh, the audio and, and the video? Uh, Again, this is not uh, done in the same time during the process. Um, the question is, what, what if you use IMF for doing that? It's exactly the same thing you ask your <coughs> preferred post-production company to do the scanning for you, but you ask to be delivered an IMF. And what this IMF will bring to you? Well, first thing is all essences will be synchronized by the CPL. So also when you have bumpers or head and tails, uh, the CPL will only define the interesting content. Um, all type of essence, including technical metadata and, and descriptive metadata as well. You, you've done, uh, you've mentioned a lot um, earlier. Uh, but that's really crucial uh, to have this synchronization, uh, synchronization uh, done. Um, the architecture of the IMF uh, permits to augment or modify the package anytime. So you can have um, your work, your, your, your scans done um, at different time and you can reconciliate everything into the, the package, whatever the time. You can use the architecture of the package to merge them or you can use supplemental packages when you're um, uh, adding versions to it. And uh, very important thing as well, uh, we're talking about a standard. So every tool, every mastering tool is understanding the IMF the same way. Another type of workflow, restoration. Um, the first thing is how do you keep trace of the restoration paces? Because um, you probably, the restoration decision is about the content owner. Uh, it's about also budgets and probably not all frames are treated the same. You can say, okay, this part just single pass and I just take maybe this shot for heavy restoration because there's some defects. So this is, I just pass a little bit uh, fast on this one, but the thing is whatever the pass you decide for your shots, um, there is a hierarchy when you do that. And this hierarchy uh, is coming from the software, restoration software that you use. Uh, so virtually, each restoration pass you do in your software, you create a new version of your content mm -hmm. at a new stage. And it's not easy to follow all those uh, variations in time. So if you imagine to do that with this workflow using IMF, you consider that each restoration pass is a version. So you can translate that directly into one CPL. So here, for example, I have my CPL referring my original content, but I can have as many CPL as have made um, image defect restoration. And obviously the final uh, fully, rest, uh, fully um, uh, pass uh, content. No image duplication. And of course, the CPLs can keep track of the restoration, restoration hierarchy and it's valid in time. And you can, when you have more budget, you can uh, add more scans, you can uh, add more versions and you still have uh, your package uh, that augments in time and it's valid. And much more important thing, when you are doing some 
heavy restoration for big big movie and you have big budget, you, you may want to uh, distribute the work over <coughs> different partners. Um, using IMF for exchanging the job uh, helps you a lot for reconciliation as well. Talking about exchange, um, that's part of it. That's uh, that the primary intent of the IMF. It was to exchange content. So archives are used to exchange content between them. Um, you have probably a version that is very interested, uh, that another archive is very interested to have because you are doing a, a felony week, uh, all those kind of things. So if you have your main archive format in IMF that contains all your versions, the only thing you need to know is to output the desired CPL <coughs> and give that to your, to your archive. It's the same if you have, are requested by a television or uh, OTT, okay, uh, please send me some uh, part of this movie because we need to do a documentary. Well, same thing. You just give either an IMF if they're able to support it or you just transcode on demand uh, deliverable for broadcast or for OTT. So this is really for exchange. Now there's a question that is always asked when you're talking about IMF and archive, it's codec. Uh, currently JPEG 2000, ProRes, OpenXR, MPEG4, simple studio profile. Those uh, codecs, those applications are coming from needs. People had the need uh, to do uh, to preserve ACES uh, content. People had the need to preserve uh, content in ProRes for broadcast reason. So the question here is, what if you as an archive are, is not uh, any of the codec here already defined in an application is not the one for you? It doesn't mean that you don't ha you, that you have to give up for IMF. Um, I'm really insisting on this. The capability of the format is not really about the codec. So if in the future there's discussions uh, currently about why don't we have an XAVC or DNxHD in, uh, in IMF, what about uncompressed frames format uh, in IMF, all this is just part of a need. So if you have some need, please say to IMF user group, uh, we need to have another format. So on our side, we don't care. <laughs> We will support it. So, um, and last, just to finish, um, one of most, the most valuable, and that's probably an introduction to uh, next session, is uh, indexation. So, catalog. The uh, the th strengths of IMF with uh, this unique identifier is one of the big thing. But it's not only there's unique particularities to the CPL, uh, and those CPL they can, for example carry either ISEN or ADEN uh, uh, identifier. Those are external references, but not only, they also can carry house, inside house IDs uh, as internal refer references, and it's unlimited. So you can also have systems, different systems, that you can all reference together inside one, one CPL. And that's it, coffee time. <laughs> two speakers for the price of one. Jean-Pierre Evin, EBU, I'm going to say a few things in particular about the metadata workflow and how you can manage metadata in IMF and why it makes sense. So the background is that, uh, of course, you can or you would like to store and save your metadata in particular for deep archiving or not deep archiving because in fact everybody is trying to reuse the archives into uh, assets that can be used into new productions. As, I, as I've always been saying, is that if you can't find it, it's like you don't have it. So either you will have to do the content again or you will have to buy it again, okay? So managing metadata to find your content is vital. So that's another reason why you would like to manage metadata well into your archives. Then the way you do it, whether you store it into some packages or whether you put it into a database, etc., it's going to more or less facilitate the way you can edit and update or enrich your metadata because this is the AI time, so artificial intelligence 
which is becoming an endless source of metadata. That's visual noise. <laughs> and, uh, and then working on your metadata workflow, because I think many people are not so serious about their metadata workflow. So what's going to happen is that um, uh, Mathieu is going to explain his use case, and I'll come back to you about uh, what is the format of metadata you are, we are using and how we use it in IMF. <coughs> Hello everybody, so I'm working for France Television and I want to show you a little use case which has uh, led us to work with, uh, with EBU on, on, the, on this context of uh, driving metadata from the production uh, to the consumers. Uh, concerning um, this project, at the origin of it, we tried to build an, a metadata ecosystem regarding a, a program, several contents, and here on this uh, use case, uh, it uh, concerns a, a drama, a daily, uh, daily show we have, uh, a fictional show we have every day. And this, uh, this project is uh, about collecting some very uh, confident metadata from the very beginning of the production uh, to drive it along the master and uh, reuse it uh, at the end. Um, why collecting some metadata at the beginning of the production is first because we can really trust them. They are validated by the production itself. It's, it's uh, not uh, able to compare that with any kind of AI indexing afterwards. So uh, here we're using a, a production uh, assistant, uh, which is a cloud-based application called SetKeeper, where uh, all the production crews uh, push their metadata in sort of let's say, common Dropbox, which is organized for maximizing uh, uh, the workflow of, of uh, preparing a production. So that's why we have uh, here accessorized uh, wardrobes, uh, product placement for sure, uh, all the description concerning also the locations, uh, real and fictional locations. And finally, uh, we can find the script in that, and the script is uh, like every, every kind of story or every kind of uh, script even for news program this is the backbone of the production so everything is in relation with the script so you, we know that this accessorize is told by this character in this sequence of this uh, scene and then that's the way it's uh, embedded into this software so let's say for example it's, it's a semantic link uh, between all those uh, assets the second row of this uh, uh, or the second level of this rocket is the post-production after shooting and the idea here is to have a large overview of what is edited in the final content. So that's the, the mastering uh, part of the, of the job. And uh, what we have done here is uh, the use of another cloud-based uh, assistant for post-production, which is connected to the first one. So as soon as the final edit is validated by, by the producers, then there is a call on between the two cloud-based applications. And then we grab all the useful metadata that the production has authorized to be published aside uh, the master to constitute a, a metadata master aside the MXF master we have now for TV. And then at, at the end of the, the chain, uh, we have the use of the metadata themselves. So why we want to collect them, I just said it's in part, uh, partially for avoiding AI to invent false metadata first to reuse what we are considering as garbage today. So when we create metadata during production, we just throw them after uh, finalizing the master. So here we want to reuse them uh, instead of uh, reconstruct them. And uh, all we can see here is the fact that today we have some very um, powerful tool for driving uh, the metadata um, use uh, after one, especially to feed the recommendation engine and the search engine and so on. So now, at this part of the story, we know how to drive the metadata from the pre-production to the master. We know to use them afterwards, but we need this link between those two, and I will leave the ball to uh, my colleague to tell about this ending story. I think the message from Mathieu is clear, is that don't produce content saying, I'll, I'll, I'll take care of the metadata later. AI is there, is there to help me and to save me. Yes, I, I'm doing a lot of AI right now. If you believe that, then try it yourself and you will see. Then uh, take care of your metadata as soon as you can. So we looked at this, we looked at IMF, 
And this is how we want to use this metadata. So there are different placeholders. <coughs> like in the CPL, you can put some metadata, okay? Uh, it has to be restricted, but it's okay. You can put uh, this metadata in its own namespace, like the EBU core, as we use it today. So are you, we are using RDF in this project because it's natively linking data, okay? But it could be XML, could be JSON, JSON-LD, whatever. Uh, if you are somebody who is playing with metadata, you know that you can do a lot of things, whatever happens. Uh, then we are also placing the dynamic metadata into an MXF file, and that is going to be put uh, as part of the, uh, the, the package, the IMF package. And then from there, you can develop a number of applications, and we had a demonstration that has been shown some time ago by, uh, by Marquis. Uh, but before that, uh, then I just want to show this problem of uh, linking data. So we are using EBU core RDF, so semantic. In fact, I, I made a presentation at the IBC on semantic for broadcast. Is semantic going to be useful for broadcast 10 years ago, 2009, okay? And we are 2019. I wish I would see more people using RDF, and I wish, uh, I could say I can see some light at the end of the tunnel, yes? But actually, I'm leaving the tunnel because I'm retiring soon, so. <laughs> so I, I don't need to see any lights at the end of the tunnel. Still, <laughs> this being said, you have all these metadata that you can take as being descriptive metadata. That's where you, put, you would put all the title descriptions, and then you would describe all the props, all the crews, all the actors that would all be there, and in the dynamic track, you put links to this metadata, so you do not repeat the old metadata along the timeline track, okay? And using RDF is just natural to link data, and you have to think about it because it's about identifying objects, identifying things, then if you, I can still see broadcasters who identify content by their title, and this is frightening me, but I'm leaving the tunnel. <laughs> All right, so the demo we had uh, with uh, Marquis is that um, you have this uh, EBU core RDF somewhere and, uh, and then you can play along the timeline with a dy dynamic metadata track and then the uh, metadata inspector developed by Marquis is getting, the, is getting the data scene by scene and you can see this data coming out. The interest also is that you can cut content, you can extract content, and then you can get the metadata that is associated with a scene, and then all the information is in fact in a different file. And then you can manage this uh, in many different ways. So either you put your data into a triple store, so a semantic database, or you put your metadata somewhere. So many different ways, metadata is extremely loaded, and every time you say a word about metadata, you could spend a day explaining why you said that word and not another. And that's, a, that's why I'm so happy to retire. All right. <laughs> um, I don't know if you have any questions, but Mathieu and me, we have to get back to Rai because we have another meeting at the EBU booth. So maybe if there is one urgent question or if, if somebody wants to take a business card to uh, contact us <laughs> later, let me know. I have a question. Okay, go. So, go <laughs> so maybe uh, for my understanding, mm -hmm. uh, so if you say you have metadata for the complete production process, mm -hmm. So how does this directly fit then to the IMF, which is at the end the master? Uh, so uh, at the end you will have much more metadata than you really uh, uh, would use in the uh, IMF itself. So would you store this separately or uh, how would you handle this? Uh, just before you go ahead, uh, see if it's about deep archiving for instance, uh, yeah. if you don't know what to do with, with your metadata, maybe it's not a bad idea to put all your metadata into this IMF package. Um, because now the amount of metadata is enormous uh, with AI, you see. Uh, so there are two things. One is about your metadata model, your metadata workflow and the metadata model. You need to have a solid metadata model to be able to do that. If you have a solid metadata model, and if you are capable of associating metadata with some metadata object, actually, then you can do whatever you want after that. Then you could even have some sort of the equivalent of a CPL for metadata, extracting just a metadata unit for a particular delivery. But uh, I don't know what you think, uh, Mathieu, about this. I totally agree. Okay. But <laughs> does it answer Which your is Yeah, yeah but, 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 uh, but I wonder, at the end you would overload the IMF uh, with metadata which you uh, have not used, let's say, in the process itself, because you... Uh, frankly, well, 
Or in the mastering itself, I would say. Yes. yes. But in the production. Although, well, that's why <laughs> although not in terms of what? Yes. Because it's, it's not in terms of weight of the file. Yeah. yeah. It's just a simple description of all the data I own. So like the character description uh, interpreted by an actor with a potential link to uh, some database to have more information about this uh, actor career. And then we have a few um, authorized metadata because at, at the beginning of all that, the producer authorized those metadata which are able to be pushed with the master and some other like the weight of the actresses that are still uh, in the system and never, I would say. So um, what we have in the dynamic track, it's only the links uh, yes. to this uh, fixed uh, this descriptive right. file. Okay. And uh, that's, uh, I think, uh, a proper way to, to avoid the, to yeah. the weight of all that. But, uh, again, preservation over, uh, against overloading, for me, doesn't make sense. If you want to make preservation, you keep everything. You don't decide in advance what you want to keep or not keep. So preservation yeah. shall never be overloading shall never be overloading. You keep everything, you keep everything. And you don't rely on AI to save your life, again. <laughs> I can tell you, I'm doing some speech to speech and different things on my demo at the EBU booth. If you can, you can come and see me and I will show you and I will tell you what are all the problems I met. So of course the different <coughs> tool providers have different accuracy, but still, all together, uh, AI is not ready to save your life yet. <laughs> and I, and um, yes. And I will never see it, actually. <laughs> okay. Any other question before they leave? <coughs> any, any, in any case, EBU 10 F20 near the sushi bar. <laughs> <laughs> near the conference center. I'm there. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. And there is another restaurant. They yeah. say Chinese food, but it's Indonesian food. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so then let's switch uh, to the next presentation from the BBC. So Brendan Malone will present. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So I think we all got the context there. Jean-Pierre is retiring, just in case we weren't clear. Um, so as part of d and &E, I uh, just want to give you a bit of context first. As part of d and &E, we build the tools and the infrastructure to support file delivery and archiving. Uh, sort of subtitle is the, is the views from the archive here because you'll see there's a, there's a couple of, sort of different views that emerge. Uh, you know, the BBC is approaching 100 years and archiving has been very much based on sort of broadcast formats. So in some respects with you know, UHD coming very fast, uh, OTT and IPTV, it's a bit like sort of back to the future. So this is a collection of thoughts. It's not, it's not saying the BBC wants this, a collection of thoughts of, of challenges and, and how maybe uh, IMF can help. So. I'm proposing not to go through this in detail because it would, could go on for maybe an hour or so, but I'm just going to talk about some key challenges. So the BBC has a Royal Charter obligation that talks about safety and security of the assets, and as a national broadcaster, then that will sort of uh, help to store and reflect the, 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 national, the national culture. Um, as I said, there's a, a, a whole sort of host of business challenges in terms of you know, the, the, the move from sort of physical media to, to files. Uh, and, and the rapid change in sort of technologies. So um, it's, it's really an opportunity for us to sort of re refresh our thoughts in how the archive works and how the archive should work. But the, bit, the big thing that's important for us is very much the, this wider reuse model. And what we're doing at the moment is you know, we're unlocking, we're liberating all of those sort of physical uh, stores and turning that into a sort of a super giant content store. So uh, the commissioning and delivery process is quite organic. Uh, it's it's uh, d deliverables are sort of are, are mostly defined sort of further downstream. <laughs> Obviously, you know something like uh, the Blue Planet might be sort of commissioned two three years uh, in it back backwards in time, but actually what's what's actually delivered uh, um, might not be uh, m might not be sort of thought of till sort of you know two or three months from a, a, from a notional transmission date. Um, and the current process, business processes and delivery processes are very sort of uh, UID based. So it's you know, commission uh, is, uh, is still very much sort of based on physical assets, or the, the physical processes that, that used to underpin, you know, files and tapes and all that type of stuff. So that's still how the, the business works from, a, from a, 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 an organizational point of view. Uh, and we still need that 
handover from the contractor because the contractor needs to be paid. So there's a sort of a, there's a break between you know, if you were de delivering a, a UHD master in IMF with all of these sort of various components, you know, you'd, you'd actually need to sort of check all of that out first uh, because it might be it might be been, uh, transmitted or published on you know five or six different types of outlets with five or six different types of standards. So there's sort of there's some questions about that, um, and. Uh, Obviously, then you still have to meet all of those delivery standards. So there's an element here of sort of risk risk transformation between sort of risk and the production space, and then that that risk uh, coming back into the sort of the broadcaster because there's things like you know photosensitive epilepsy where people can get killed if you're not if you're not if you don't take it seriously. Um, so from a commissioning point of view, you know you would need to have sort of significant efficiencies to and, and supporting editorial propositions to justify the cost of retooling for some of this type of technology, uh, and uh, to to operate in this sort of new world, you'd you'd actually sort of need the the, the tools to be sort of very uh, carefully thought out and be ubiquitous across the business as we've done for for file based delivery. So. I was the product manager for file-based delivery, and we, in two years we sort of completely moved from physical tapes to AWS cloud-based solution, and that's across all of the sort of uh, various parts of the BBC. So it can it can be done, but it just sort of requires all the sort of the the, the correct sort of business rationale and, and the and the right sort of thinking to be done in, in place. Um, and I suppose from a from a practical point of view, we've still got this sort of. Um, requirement to support topicality so uh, as I said Blue Planet might be commissioned two or three years ago uh, but we still got the likes of Graham Norton's that are sort of commissioned ad hoc and, and deliver on the day so it's this sort of sort of uh, tension between sort of long form uh, assets that are you know commissioned in, 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 in years and long form assets that are com commissioned in sort of hours or weeks or days you know that type of stuff. So the delivery team, uh, the delivery team basically need to be able to sort of have all of these sort of uh, parameters at their fingertips in terms of you know what has been commissioned, what has been delivered, uh, uh, perform all of the checks. <coughs> Excuse me. Where we could be going potentially is um, taking taking sort of a, a master IMF and then producing error copies for all of these different platforms. Uh, but as I say, that you know, brings back a sort of an element of risk for us. Um, the current archive, so this is sort of this is sort of the current archive approach, which is really sort of interesting. So, you know, based on that sort of hundred years of sort of managing that physical assets, um, that we have sort of moved into, you know, because of uh, uh, intellectual property rights and you know various commissioning models and stuff like that. There, we have we have sort of a discussion between the commissioner uh, and ourselves about what. What it is we're actually archiving, so we don't necessarily absolutely archive everything to the same standards. We've got you know in-house content that we produce, and that's archived to to one to one standard in terms of um, longevity and 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 uh, the amount of copies that we would hold. Whereas uh, something uh, that, uh, uh, an indie production, we would just maybe keep reduce that down. So there's sort of different standards for that. Uh, and the current policy is sort of very much sort of based on you know. If there's a change in any metadata or media at all, there's a new master is generated. So you know this sort of flies in the in the face of concept of, of IMF, where hopefully you'll be able to get to the position where you might be updating metadata all the time. You know, so if this was a current policy, uh, th uh, that you know, we, we recently took uh, one of the uh, Blue Planet files that was sort of multiple terabytes. So if you know, on the under the current policy, if you change you know, even one byte of that, you would be having to have multiple, you know, multiple deliveries of the same thing in. So that, that that's you know, part of the part of the tension. Um, and there's there's a sort of the the current way that we sort of check um, the integrities of files is checked in the in the ingest pipeline and so in the file delivery uh, pipeline we create the md5 value and then that's passed off into the archive so uh, as, we, as we talked uh, earlier on about having that sort of integrity check all the way along it's it's very important so you know, one of the current views from the archive is that sort of from an archive view it's sort of mf is potentially sort of incompatible with the way that broadcast work archive workflows work because of that need to sort of to potentially constantly change stuff um, and, and, and potentially then wanting to keep the integrity of that asset absolutely, you know, bite for bite, exactly the same all the way along through the archive process. So, what if? 
So what if uh, you know uh, we, you can sort of read some of these in your own in your own time, but things like things like you know if we always added components and never removed stuff, um, if we had new media, could it you know trigger a new master to be sent? Uh, if there was new ways of 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 checking the integrity, so potentially you know. Look, looking at the integrity of the actual physical assets and then updating the metadata and undoing sort of comparisons uh, and, and proving that that, uh, that that the media was secure uh, that that's you know these are all sort of uh, opportunities for going forward um, the uh, there's sort of standard things about you know wanting to be able to export stuff um, from non IMF assets and from from IMF assets but also things like as as we're in this sort of mixed economy between sort of service providers, you know, when, when you're taking content in, you still have to be able to share components out with folks that might be doing subtitles and you know generating subtitles for you and bringing those back. So there's there's a whole sort of issue around uh, you know how you can share components in IMF and how you can bring them back and how you can track them and how you can attach them and how then that links back into the archive master. Okay, so uh, then these are all sort of opportunities that, that Jean-Pierre uh, um, Mathias was talking about in terms of, you know, there are sort of new editorial propositions that we can, we can do, potentially sort of deliver in terms of looking at sort of now next options, uh, bringing camera and essence and particularly sort of QC and, and PSE information into, into the mix so we can, we can sort of have that rich metadata flow all the way through. Uh, in through the sort of the production process, in the delivery process, and into the archive process, um, and obviously from a from a, a really interesting one as a, as an archivist you know, view, if you have a UHD master, um, you want to be able to go in and look at a proxy rendition of that, and then select whatever you want, and, and maybe sort of generate that into the into uh, the OTT you know, uh, proxy version that you want, or you want to take the sort of the SD master or the, the UHD master. So there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sort of an issue there or a question about, you know, what asset that you're having access to and what access, what uh, asset that you can recall and, and all of that type of stuff, because we're very much sort of focused on, on reuse. Shane, as they say in Irish. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Brenton. So uh, now we come uh, to a uh, uh, first panel discussion. So uh, I would invite uh, all panelists uh, to come uh, to the front. And then uh, we start with some uh, intro uh, keynotes from each panelist. So uh, yeah, we have four panelists. So. Uh, as we have not so much time and the day is restricted, we have said, okay, let's do a panel so that uh, each one can have a, a, a first uh, aspect of his uh, vision, how we should uh, improve IMF. And then uh, we uh, discuss a little bit more uh, uh, what uh, the different aspects mean to this topic. So, uh, yeah, we have Steve Fish. Uh, Formerly uh, from Turner Broadcasting, now consultant. We have Mathieu Fasani from Dalet. We have David uh, Delo from Sony Pictures. And we have Nobuki Yoshiyama from NHK. So, uh, yeah, please sit down, uh, I would say. And uh, let's first uh, go step by step. Uh, who uh, The best way would be that uh, the one who has some slides start. Uh, uh, so, who has the slides? Okay, so, Steve. <laughs> Where did I store your slides? When sent you, did you send the slides? Yeah, we uh, the on stick right before we started. Search that folder for you. Ah, panel, panel. There it is. Yeah. Okay, yeah, please right. go ahead. Perfect. Hello. Um, 
So I have a couple of slides together here. One of the one of the things that uh, well, first of all, I'm Dave from Dave Dilo from Sony Pictures. Hi, good to see you all. Um, one, two of the interesting technologies we've been looking at uh, that go that seem to go together pretty well within the SEMTI community have been IMF and AXF. Uh, we've been pretty big components of IMF for all of our distribution mastering, and we've been looking at AXF as a solution for our archiving mastering. And the two, and everyone has kind of said, you know, what is the big, what's the difference between the two? How do the two work together? So I also work within 31FS uh, with, in defining uh, AXF standards and AXF uh, part one and part two as we go. The whole idea is to really, th they are very different uh, formats, so really want to just throw together a few slides to show you guys what uh, the perspective was from, from at least a, a content provider's standpoint as to what, how these two technologies work together. Uh, if we look at the two of them at, at a top level, IMF is a mastering is a standardized mastering format for interoperability, right? It uh, it does things like preserve media content, it standardizes it, it organizes things into uh, assets, into compositions, and compositions for uh, for final exhibition. When we look at AXF, it's very different. It it is a format that is designed for long-term preservation with a lot of key characteristics in there. The core of AXF is what they call an object, and that is the, that is the actual archive. And where that object lives and how that object is structured, it sits around the metadata that can be associated with either with inside of it or as part of the actual format itself is, is pretty comprehensive. And the whole idea is, with AXF is that it is a preservation format for long term. When we look at the functions of each, uh, breaking it out, I'm not going to go through each one of these, uh, but I think a lot of everyone understands, at least in this room, most of you understand what IMF is, that it is a structured media format. It has CPL, it, it, it contains uh, codecs, <coughs> essence files, and it has things uh, that can act upon it like OPLs. When we look at the AXF side of things, um, it has a, it has a, um, it contains an associated set of files, obviously. It has really no limits or parameters around what you can put in there, uh, what types of data, and number of files, and the, the size of the actual archive itself. Um, of course, practicality kicks in at some point. Uh, create, probably creating a two petabyte object is not a good idea for, uh, for just transportation and all that stuff. You don't really want to get into it th that much, but um, that, there are, there are some practicality reasons that you would uh, structure AXF, but at the core of it, it's really uh, effectively an unlimited archive preservation format with a lot of data checks. Um, when we look at what is created inside of a production, we look at it as we have things like, we have scripts, we have edit notes, we have budgets, uh, we have all this stuff, and at the bottom, you can see we have we have uh, image essence, audio essence, and time text, which are what a lot of people think of as the actual essence, as the actual assets. Whereas in a side of production, you really have a lot of these other things going on. And what do you do with them? Because you don't really put them into IMF. Effectively, you take the image, audio, and time text. That is what you put into your IMF, and that's what goes out for either distribution or what you consider some some kind of final archive. What happens is, in order to leverage this at an AXF level or an archive level, we look at all that stuff and say, well, that's all interesting that we want to capture. We want to put it into a unified archive format as well, alongside of the IMF, which is considered the, um, the image and audio and time text essence of what we are doing. So it really, when we look at what AXF is, it's really not so much to replace uh, IMF, it really is to encompass it as a long-term preservation format. And those objects then are, um, are the things that we can put anywhere. We can put it on tape, we can put it on, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter what format of tape if we look at it being, uh, if we look at it being LTFS, we look at it being any kind of other format, even TAR, or even just writing it directly out to LTO on a physical level is fine. 
The great part about that is those, ob those objects, that AXF format, can also be transported easily into cloud formats, into object stores, uh, local, local premise, any kind of storage that you want to do. It is very transportable. But the, uh, but the core of the AXF is, it, it, the functionality of it is really what we're going for. When, um, when you look at a structure of AXF, there's things that produce a manifest, so to speak, an object header and an object footer. The object footer is essentially what is in this, what is in this um, archive. And the best part about that is it sits kind of on the wrapper side of the AXF. So you can access that without having to crack open and restore the actual essence what's inside of your AXF objects. So that's one of the key um, features of what we're looking at AXF for. And the way that, we, the way that we're kind of looking at this is we, all, we look into IMF. We have, we have things like PKL, CPL. We have, uh, we have a lot of that essence. We have a lot of that stuff that wraps the essence, the assets, into what is the format of IMF. Well, when we want to put that into AXF, it kind of gets represented into that object <laughs> footer uh, as into a, what they call a file tree. And down at the bottom, bottom right here, you'll see, you know, this is kind of hard to see, but there is a file tree. And inside of that file tree, it's a representation of everything that's in that archive. So folder, file structure. The cool part is when you pull that out and you parse it, it can be represented in a, in a virtual sense. You can see what's in what's in the object. The, when you look at the standard for it, under each one of those file attributes, the, the standard defines a couple of uh, this, this table of what is, a, what is inside of that, uh, what is allowed for that individual entry. Uh, and you, you can see there's a lot of, lot of different stuff that it allows for. But the key one is down at the bottom where it says any. That any, um, is kind of is, is exactly what it is. It's any. Uh, so when we look at this, if we put an entry, if we put an entry in for like a CPL into an AXF object, we can effectively take the contents of that CPL, put it into the any field, and what that allows us to do is have now an archive that you don't have to open in order to access your 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 packaging materials that are inside of IMF. And that's kind of critical for things like uh, MAM systems that just want to scrape a bunch of AXF objects and be able to index them, have access to what the essence of your IMF is, because that effectively is what your CPL, your PKL, all your XML files that are in there. Having that available within an object wrapper, uh, so an archive wrapper, gets very interesting for us. And that's kind of where we're looking at it and thinking, well, wow, if we did something like that, we moved it into that any field, we now have access. It doesn't matter where that archive lives. We don't care if it lives in the cloud, on tape, somewhere. We have our object footers that are already pre-indexed by our, our content systems, so they know where to go and look for them. And it's a matter of then going and getting the interesting associated uh, assets that, 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 is, that are pointed back to by these referring files. So. Uh, Dave, may I remind you on the time? Uh, so sorry about that. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. So maybe it's not a French thing. It's a yeah. Los Angeles <laughs> thing, maybe. So, so anyways, that, that's kind of what we were looking at for it, and, but that was, that was the last thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I was a little bit curious because you have uh, 12 slides and you are now at slide 6 of yeah, 12. Yeah, I, I decided to cut it short. <laughs> that's why I put that one in there. <laughs> Okay. But no, I just wanted to, the, that, that was really it. I mean, when, when you look at it, that's kind of what we were going for. That, that translation of IMF to AXF is, was, was what we were really going for on the preservation for it. That, that these two technologies both do things, um, both do their jobs very well. IMF is an interoperable uh, media wrapper. AXF is an, is an archive wrapper, and it's... You know, if you a very crude analogy is if you look at AXF as a zip file, it's a super intelligent standardized zip file, which is which I, I know that the AXF uh, people who are very big proponents are of of of, of uh, long term archive with AXF do not like, but you know effectively it is. It's the wrapper. It has a lot of standardized things that that is backed by SEMTI, and that's kind of where we're going with a lot of this. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.
Okay, thanks, uh, Dave. Then we will go to uh, Nobuki Yoshiyama. Uh, Okay, uh, thank you, Siegfried San. Uh, thank you, Pierre. Uh, yeah. See. Yeah, it's yeah. already on. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, firstly, I should say that uh, we are not, uh, we haven't implemented, we haven't adapted IMF yet. We are potential IMF, uh, IMF user. Uh, so, uh, friends, it's good to be here. Uh, I'm Nobuki Yoshiyama from NHK Archives. Uh, uh, this is a very first time for us, NHK, to uh, participate in this IMF UG. So uh, please allow me to introduce ourselves very quickly because I'm sure you will know why we have such high expectations for our IMF in archiving. Uh, and you will know why just by knowing who we are and uh, what we have been doing. Okay. Take this uh, down. Okay. okay. Sorry about confusion. Uh, so we are Japan's largest and the sole public broadcaster, and we are often compared with the BBC in the UK because we are both uh, publicly, publicly funded uh, broadcasters. Uh, we started the uh, first TV broadcast back in the uh, 1950s, and let's jump to our uh, 1980s. Uh, some of you might be surprised to know that we did not start systematic uh, storage until as late as 1981. Uh, that means for the first 30 years of uh, TV broadcast, we don't have every contents of TV broadcast. Some survived, not all of them. Uh, why? Because during that period of time, the broadcast tape, the two-inch tape, was very, very expensive. So people had to uh, use the same tape again and again. Uh, overwriting programs. Uh, Erasing them. I think the situation was the same for the BBC. Yep. <laughs> so in short, we uh, <laughs> lost those uh, contents because we could not afford. We lost them because there was no technology available back then, unfortunately. Uh, please remember that because we, we will come back this, this, to this later. And the last year, we started uh, 4K and HK UHD broadcasts. Uh, and we've been able to uh, revive 16 millimeter films kept in our vault to be scanned to create 4K HDR version. That means if you preserve your contents at their highest quality, you'll be able to reuse them. You have assets if you have them in a higher quality. And then at the beginning of this year, we joined it the DPP because we've been facing problems or challenges uh, and because we are facing a big events as you can see. Okay. Next. Oh, no, it was on the screen but not oh. on the yes. yeah. yeah. Oh, I okay. <laughs> so we have uh, started the uh, UHD broadcast but what we've been doing basically is just keep them in LTOs and then put on the shelves because files are too big to be ingested in a MAM system. Also, there's a demand that we should be ready to preserve all sports of uh, Tokyo 2020. But how? We're going to need uh, miles of LTO shelves. And that's not very uh, sophisticated way of doing things. And that's, what, that's why we've been uh, keen to find an efficient me means to uh, preserve high quality contents. Uh, here, let's look at our lessons, especially the second one. We lost the variable contents, and now we are facing the same problem. Are we going to have to abandon 
preserving 4K and 8K contents because we don't have technology available. I don't want to follow that same path. I don't want anybody here to do the same uh, because they're not just assets, they are cultural heritage. So uh, that's why time is really against us in terms of, uh, I mean, when it comes to archiving. Okay, uh, here are some use cases in our mind. That's basically what we are doing with the 2K contents. Uh, so last three, let me just tell you that it's been pretty much encouraging to know that people are, more and more people are uh, uh, becoming interested in uh, IMF in archiving. And uh, we're looking forward to the opportunity to uh, work, work together. That's it. Thank you very much. OK. So yeah, let, let's continue. Uh, Mathieu, maybe you can say some words. Yeah, and then Steve, and then we go to the interactive part more. So I, I am French, but I don't have any slides, so uh, I'll do my best to be short. Um, <laughs> so I'm working at Dalet. Uh, what we've been doing over the last 29 years was to deliver media asset management systems. So really having a way to deliver easily content to uh, many people and deliver supply chains to be able to exchange content and discover different use cases from archives to production to distribution. Um, so what we saw that those last years um, was really uh, first a, a high demand for a compression of the supply chain, being much more efficient, deliver quickly more content. And this has put some pressure on, on finding our um, <coughs> better efficiencies in all the components that you have in your workflows. Um, so for us, a key starting point was really to adopt a, a new paradigm in terms of modeling the objects in the system, which is to support component-based um, elements in the system. So moving down um, um, the, uh, the model in terms of um, assets um, so that we have a good granularity to manage individually all those different components. And you are much more efficient in how you can reassemble them on the fly, uh, optimize the way you store the different components on different storages, and how you can present that and deliver efficiently content in many different use cases. So obviously, the first use cases that have been seen so far were more at the end of the chain, because that's where content is delivered to the end users. But once you start to put in place a MAM, obviously, your content is also going to be in the archive. So there is an obvious um, use case and some benefits in adopting IMF or component-based workflows also for archiving use cases. And um, there is one thing that has not been mentioned in the previous presentations, because you, you've seen all the challenges but, and the benefits of IMF, is also the, the challenge of um, abstracting the, not the complexity, because it's a negative word, but the sophistication of IMF. Because when you think about it, you are like exploding one object, one asset into many components, adding layers of, uh, of, uh, of uh, new logical components and it can be complex for users. So you need to find a way to abstract that complexity and show that to users uh, without losing the benefits of the, uh, the, that you can get from IMF, automating processes, optimizing the way you can manage the storage, and so on. Um, so that's the, the use case that I wanted to point on and, um, and, um, and not to reinforce all the, uh, the benefits and the points that have been discussed before. Okay, thank you. And, yeah. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Steve Fish. I'm now an independent um, consultant, or as I've begun to realise, or, or more properly become a media therapist. <laughs> um, I used to work for a, a multi-channel, multilingual company, and one of the things I'd like you to imagine for a second is the board is sitting here, and you go to them, and they're, they're, they've asked the question, how do we improve our workflows? How do we make sure that when I ask the question is, what... Dutch content have we got, the answer can be turned up in about 20 seconds. At the moment, for my previous company, this could actually take about two or three weeks, if you were lucky. So you say to the board, well, we can do something about it. And they go, well, how did we get into this position? And I said, well, each department has kind of done their own thing. We've never really had a set of standards across an entire enterprise that allows us to preserve information. So we did what everybody else did, which was do stuff and then throw the information away. But it's all right because everybody else has done it. So we're all right, we're fine. And they said, well, that's not really acceptable. We need something 
that um, improves our ability to respond. The world has changed, as we all know. We need to get content out there more quickly. We need to know what assets we've got, and we need to know the value of them. So what, what we looked at was said, how are we going to do this? What, what makes sense? We've got content going back 100 years or maybe more than 100 years. It's been localized in 30 to 60 different territories. Each territory has some sort of compliance need, which is very different. So we've got all these assets which are very slightly different. What we need is something that brings these together, something that's commercially viable. It looks after the information natively. It doesn't require any other systems. It's actually inbuilt. Um, and it preserves quality. So what we started to do was start a big IMF project to really look at how do we bring it in from the production end, which could be movies, it could be series, it could be news. It, it didn't really matter. What do we do at the production end? And then how do we preserve it through the information? How do we bring all of these hundred years of mucking about with it? Well, realistically, we've only been mucking about with it for 30 years because of, you know, it was, that was a time we do fortunately have the old film, which we didn't reuse, so we were, we were good on that. But how do we bring this together and how do we use it? And I think throughout the afternoon, we've heard various different ways of, of using IMF and the, the power and the benefits of the CPL and how you could have multiple CPLs against a number of uh, core essence assets, which really allowed us to go, yeah, actually there is a single method. We can have each frame can now be unique. We can index it, we can understand it, and we can, use, we can understand where it's used. And with any luck, we can then start to use, we can then start to do the exploitation that we really want to do, which is to give the answers that the board want and their ability to know how they're going to move on and how they can exploit new markets very quickly. It's my three minutes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, guys. <laughs> now we will it more interactive and you have the choice to uh, ask questions, but uh, I would like to, to start first with a question to the panel. Uh, and uh, what I see in the moment is uh, uh, IMF started as an exchange format uh, for the post-production. So uh, at the end, of course, uh, you have content which is pre-produced, I would say, or uh, and uh, now, uh, at least in the second part of this session, we saw more and more that uh, IMF might be the format for everything. Uh, so that means uh, it might be good for, let's say, production process, it might be good uh, to add additional content in sidecars, in XML or whatever. And on the other hand side, we have also uh, media asset management systems. Uh, we have AXF. <coughs> uh, so the question is, uh, what way should IMF go? Uh, should it be extended more so that it can be used for everything? Should it be uh, constrained like it is and uh, should we add additional components uh, uh, like AXF <coughs> or, or other formats to this? Uh, so what would be the easiest way uh, in a media asset management uh, maybe to preserve all of this? Maybe this first question to, to Mathieu. Okay, so I, I think I'll start with the I think one of the first uh, starting points is really to take IMF. I think the, if I would have to find a, a synonym of IMF, I would say that it's a component-based um, application in an interoperable way. I think that's that's the way I would uh, describe it. Describe it, and it's a more a framework than anything else. So once you've put that framework in place, it will evolve. It is flexible, and and we see that there are, there's already a number of applications. Um, there are open doors and mechanisms to link the objects to the outside, um, the IDARs, the ISANs, so uh, the ways to add sidecar metadata. So it's really a f an open framework that, that has a lot of potential for the future. Um, these, all those objects that are referenced that can carry metadata information, they can be uh, referenced, they can be exchanged easily, um, they can be referenced in the MAM, and we can leverage that potential to automate stuff. So, the way I see it is more as a framework rather than more a specification of something which is closed. Um, so there are many different use cases. We need to see exactly which use cases are, are the best or will really fit this component-based approach. But that's the way I would, uh, I, would, uh, I would see it today. Okay. So uh, let's say it in this way. We saw in the uh, past that we have uh, maybe started with uh, 
single image sequences like TPX, like uh, IML, uh, like uh, TIFF. Now we have this componentized approach with uh, IMF, with DCP. Uh, nevertheless, for me, the question is, of course, uh, how flexible can it be uh, in the future? So, uh, I mean, uh, it's very difficult to say uh, we can make it more flexible or uh, uh, I do not know uh, what objects we should put in this. So, uh, so maybe for so the question is, uh, um, if you have seen the presentation today, so we have the uh, IMF, uh, the send preservation package I presented is something in between, let's say, IMF and AXF. So uh, because we thought uh, we might need some additional playlists, some additional hash checking, but we need also a kind of structured, uh, uh, let's say, media package. So AXF is more abstract in this way. So uh, do you think there is a need for this intermediate format or not? Or can it be done uh, with IMF and AXF alone? So maybe a question to Dave. Yeah, so w w well, when you look at the two, um, there is there is a little bit of a gap. And I think some of the applications within IMF are, ten are trying to bridge a lot of that from app four to app five to really capture some of the upstream essence of what of what people are doing and creating in the production creation process of it um, and maybe a too big of a jump for, for us to look at it and say oh uh, we have our IMF packages we have our distribution we have theoretically we have our masters inside of IMF and we want to also capture all that other stuff that I have on the slide, which is you know, script notes, all the stuff that kind of gets turned over at the end of a production, right? Um, it's kind of hard to capture that in a unified format because productions by nature are very ad hoc, they're very nomadic, they go wherever they land, uh, whatever technology is available to them, on, both on set, both by, and adopted by like a DP, by your script uh, people and ultimately editorial and your uh, your um, your master your daily facility, all that stuff, all that proprietary information, doesn't fit really nicely inside of a container. So when you look at a long-term preservation archive that you're trying to do at a studio level for for any given title, AXF fits that bill. It's the most open standard, or it's a standard that is open to bringing all that stuff in, associating with it, associating any kind of metadata from proprietary databases to all that other stuff into a standardized format, at least a container that we know is suited for long term. How uh, an in-between format that suits uh, what, you, what you had presented, that, sure, that fits too. Um, I think that the goalposts that I'm looking at are, the, are those two, where you, the end game, I don't want it to be, I don't want my long-term archives to be LTFS bound. I want them to be something more intelligent, relatable, that can use a medium like LTFS or be flexible and pivot to any other medium that I want it to be. So those are kind of the, getting from production to archive in, in a standardized way is kind of what we're trying to define. That pipeline of getting everything into a unified fashion ultimately promotes uh, more automation and you know you can act upon AXF, you can do anything you want, you can use AI services. Uh, it, it's, it's, it becomes more of just an open-ended um, way of getting things into the standardized format yeah. for us. Yeah, <coughs> but uh, maybe one important question is, uh, and I do not know who wants to answer this, uh, what should we preserve uh, for long term? So because uh, if I look to the history and I would say 100 years ago, what do we have uh, from 100 years ago? Then it's uh, probably uh, some distribution copies, nothing else uh, like uh, uh, film. Now we want to preserve uh, everything, first question. So uh, everything which we have produced or which we have on file should be long term archived. Uh, so that means should we do this? Uh, because we can do it, or should uh, we, uh, let's say, uh, try to find a, a management system so to preserve only the things which 
we believe that uh, is necessary. I, th I think this depends on who you ask. So, so, so for us, if you ask the production teams, they, they, they would typically not want to have to search through the stuff. So if you'd preserved absolutely everything without any indexing and without any other information, they typically would go to the current master, pull out whatever they needed and do whatever they wanted with that. If they had some kind of index, would it make it easier? Possibly. But there's a commercial cost to all of this. You know, how much do you want to store? How much do you want to manage? I mean, what, one of the things I found when we were researching a lot of this is the cost of storage is much less relevant than it was a few years ago. But the cost of managing it starts to spiral. Um, and about 10 years ago when I did the equation, it was about 10 to 1 cost. So the cost of me managing it was 10 times the cost of the per gigabyte on, on storage. So how you look after the data, how you manage it, I think ultimately just becomes a commercial decision and how well your systems are set up to cope with the information and, and, and what you want to do. Do you ever go back to those wireframes? Do you ever go back to those animatics? Very rarely nowadays. You know, we, we don't have time to do a lot of that stuff. Um, and, and that's speaking as a the more broadcast end. There might be other answers to it, but I think it's going to be very business context uh, and aware. <coughs> we have a question online that's, yeah. that's related, actually. Is, uh, sure. um, so physical media versus cloud. Right, so the, is the move to component-based workflows an opportunity to move from physical media to cloud? Pluses, minuses? I mean, uh, 10 years ago, I would have, somebody would have asked me the question, would movies, pristine masters ever be put online? And I would have said never, and now it's uh, routine. So any thoughts on this? I think it's more um, implementa implementation choice. So of course, the having a component-based approach allows you to decide even at the level of the component itself so you could decide that the audio would go one way and the video in another another part of the business it's full now the uh, what is important is to have this flexibility now and based on the business constraints is to decide what is the best strategy but it should not be a technological constraint or a standard constraint for, for that answer and i'll add to that um for for physical, so right now, uh, some of our archive set rules are to triplicate and to geographically separate. So what things like cloud, the pivot to cloud allows us to do is to reduce the amount of geographically physical separations of what we're trying, of what those archives are. So instead of doing three physical copies, maybe we do one physical copy and two virtual or maybe we do two physical, uh, effectively, it allows us, number one, to give a, it, it gets us to a point where we're reducing our physical migration footprint. And number two, um, when you have an online archive, a cloud-based archive, you effectively have instant access to it. So it uh, reduces the time for physical restoration of those assets from, from the physical archive. It, it gives us more of an immediate immediacy to those archives. I think that, that it's an interesting debate because the the whole concept of IMF allows you to actually preserve the archive while still accessing things. And one of the things from a multi-channel situation is I want to be able to access, do some work, and then post it back so that it represents the overall master, an increase in the asset value, and it looks like an increase in archive, which is very different to the way we thought about archives in the past as being complete preservation. So the opportunity has changed immensely. And, and what we've seen is the only real way to do that successfully is in the cloud. It, it, it doesn't make sense to have it ge geographically fixed to a certain point. I want to be able to use it anywhere, and I want the most relevant talent to be able to access it, deal with it, and, and, and add to that archive and the, the value of that asset. Yeah, maybe I have also a question to nobuki -san. So uh, we have heard that uh, in the first 30 years, uh, uh, no asset was stored. Uh, uh, because uh, it was live produced and, and uh, sent out. Uh, so today uh, you have the challenge of, of producing 8K content. And uh, so would it not even better to say, at least I will preserve, let's say, a, a smaller uh, resolution instead of uh, having at the end nothing uh, uh, preserved? So, uh, and what would uh, be the... the the best uh, storage for your content uh, at the end? Uh, would it be data? Would it be cloud? Would it be film? Would 
What do you think? Well, it's, uh, well, the lesson we have learned from the past is that we should, you know, uh, preserve the contents at their highest quality for reuse, for as uh, considering the value of the assets, and uh, that's what we're trying to do right now. So 8K. Okay, and uh, everything was what you produce or uh, only a selection of the uh, content which you uh, sent? Uh, we preserve uh, the prey out and what we call creams. That's a, that, that's a foot, yeah, foot into That's right, that's right. Uh, but for 8K books, we don't uh, air 24 hours. It, yeah. It's not, it's not <laughs> 24 7 now, so. <laughs> not yet. Not, not yet, yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> not yet, but maybe in the future, yeah. Maybe in 2020. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Any question from the audience? Yeah, uh, and the yeah. back. Okay. That's um, not, yeah. So one of the key things, I think, is the, uh, you know, talking about cloud or local file systems. Uh, one of the key things is the actual nature of the file systems that you're writing the data to. Um, for example, the can, can you speak up a little bit louder? Please? Yeah, sorry. Okay, the contrast between, say, a versioning file system, like a file system like DFS or BTRFS, which can do versioning with minimal storage overhead. Uh, so you don't need to write another copy of the entire thing if just a little bit changes, as opposed to, say, file systems which are object-based, which tend to be used by cloud providers, which are very different in the way that they handle the data. So this is a key thing in terms of like how you manage something which is changing. Obviously something like the INS package is something which is inherently going to have changes made for metadata or, or something else. So how do you best sort of store that? And the key thing there is how, what type of file system we use, wherever it is. <laughs> the unit of change is uh, the composition playlist, and every new composition playlist has its own identity, and we don't have the idea of superseding uh, necessarily, if you want to have a, a, a permutation of something, you simply create a new entity that points to all that data, and because the composition playlist is small, the storage overhead is trivial, you know, especially in a well-managed file system. So essentially, by decomposing the the composition into the components, we've done away with the need to uh, use additional disk space for versioning because the unit of versioning is so small that allows us to keep all of our versions as we go. So, but, but maybe this brings me to a question to Brendan, because Brendan mentioned that uh, if uh, you make any change uh, uh, in the assets, then you will recreate uh, the IMF or the package itself and and store it. So what do you do with uh, the previous version? Do you store this as well or do you throw it away or? Well, see, that's, that's, that's the conundrum. And that, that's why I said that's the current archive policy. Uh, so there's a, there's, a, there's a bit of a sort of a, a discussion, let's call it a discussion, between sort of engineering who would like to go down that approach in terms of you know, update metadata and have a small, small offset and, and look, at the, look at the difference and but also track what the original, the, the, the hash of the original media is. So I, I think clearly, you know, we would like to go to more automation. <coughs> we, would, we, we are getting bigger files all the time. Uh, it's really fascinating the discussion between sort of, you know, object stores and you know, virtual stores and stuff like that there, because you know, these are all sort of things that, that we're looking at. But you know, current archive policy says, if there's a bit changes, uh, then there's a new master created. Uh, but, you know, I don't, personally, I don't think that's sustainable going to the future. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and that would have to change. But, you know, we have to provide the policy makers the assurance and the guarantee that, you know, this, the, the file integrity is correct. And, this, and, the, and, the, and from a preservation point of view, that, that maybe is protected. Okay. Yeah. Uh, maybe John was earlier, yeah? Okay, okay. You want to comment? Uh, I, I have a comment. Um, I'm with the U.S. Library of Congress, and we've dealt with this, and we don't obviously have all the answers. We have 
we've felt every single one of your pains because we have a heterogeneous data set that is very, very large. You know, we've got 255 million feet of film. We've got, you know, 4 million audio assets. We've got 3 million video assets. So, and, and we've got everything that we've talked about today. We've got stems, we've got outs, we've got original production, we've got different versions of original production. We've got four versions of Gone with the Wind alone, which is eight reels of film times four times however many copies that we have. Yeah. And so um, as a comment, what I'm seeing here and, and what we've, the way we've thought about it is um, uh, this is a sliding scale. And at some point, and, and AXF is on the archive end of the scale because it's a bit bucket. It's meant for storage. It's meant for how do you organize your data? Because we participated in the drafting of AXF, and it, uh, the the portion that we brought to AXF was we have certain data storage challenges that current HSMs are not addressing terribly well. So we've got data storage and especially long-term data storage challenges because our minimum rights window for copyright in the United States where the copyright registry is 150 years. So my <coughs> minimum planning period for my data set that I'm responsible for is 150 years. So clearly I'm not going to see the end of this. But you know, our, <laughs> our job is to design, you know, this is a marathon and from a data perspective, our job is to hand off the best baton to the next person who's going to take up our jobs in our, in our, uh, in our group. And so um, IMF fits really, really well in the production, into distribution, into that, that nether world where we start crossing over between versioning, which IMF addresses really well currently and probably could address some more, into long-term data set design and management because that's really what we're talking about when we're going to the deep archive the data set that's going to survive for a hundred years 150 years however long you know essentially permanent data sets last you know nhk's material is another great example sony's is another great example um, what we're really talking about is designing a data set that can survive for the long term and imf is a, a toolkit that can help prepare that material that gets into storage, whether that be physical instantiations or it be cloud, and if we all really think about it, cloud is just somebody else's yes. physical instantiation. <laughs> it's just we're not doing it ourselves. And so, um, you know, the way we've thought about it is there's the data set design and management over time. What, is, what do we need to put, whether it be the bit bucket with all the stems and the final production and the metadata and the databases, you know, everything that went into that production. Um, IMF, how much of those skill sets um, can be put into the production and distribution functions that IMF is designed to preserve? And then IMF could go into something like a, uh, AXF, because AXF is a bit bucket. It's meant for storage. It's not a media file format. It's just meant for storing things, a standardized way of storing things. And so I see IMF has its role, and it's going to grow over time as we learn how this thing called IMF works in production, in distribution, and frankly, in long-term archiving, because IMF is going to take up, it, it looks like it's going to take up a lot of the mantle of you know what we preserve for final production, what folks like us at the Library of Congress who are copyright registries get as the mandatory deposit copies. And then, you know, at some point, things will cross over to data set to the design and management, which is AXF, which is the feeders that go into IMF, which is how do you get the metadata into the, into the pipeline. You know, there are going to be, there's going to be standardization work on that. So we viewed it as a, um, as a panorama the question is, where does IMF, how many roles does IMF fill today? How many can it fill in the future to make our lives easier? And then what's the crossover point to data set design and management, which is we've got all this lovely data, now how do we make it survive for a couple hundred years? Okay, thank you. So unfortunately, we are running out of time. So uh, sorry, John and Rado. Uh, I think you should preserve this for the next time. It's more important to discuss a little bit more what are the next steps, and uh, I think I would hand over to Pierre right. uh, so uh, to see uh, how we can continue this, this discussion, because I think 
uh, there are still many open questions uh, and uh, we should discuss how we can address this and uh, uh, what would be the next steps for IMF uh, or for the complete ecosystem to make archiving uh, possible. So uh, thank you panel first. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, everybody, and Siegfried. <coughs> so we're um, about 10 minutes from the schedule end. So we got back on schedule. Thank you very much for that. A um, couple of trying concluding words. Um, so I think a, at least a good news is we're just at the beginning of this um, transition to digital archives, right? So the numbers that the CNC shared and uh, Swedish uh, Film Archive shared, you know, they're not 100% conversion, right? So we still and uh, folks like NHK are starting and BBC as well as uh, well underway, but not the entire library has been converted. So I think we have the ability to actually um, do something together, right? And uh, I think the goal here is uh, try to avoid uh, a million different systems that each work differently, right? And that's simply uh, less education needed, less testing, um, just common sense. Um, but as uh, Siegfried pointed out, I think there's a lot of questions that are unanswered. I mean, we had only four hours this afternoon. I'm, I don't think the goal was to solve all problems in the universe. And so something that maybe we ought to spend the next 10 minutes thinking about is how do we continue this conversation, right? What is the right forum to do that? Or do we want to continue this discussion? I mean, there are a lot of um, groups out there that have been working on this, some very l local, some other international. And so... I'd like to maybe open the floor and see if there's uh, an interest in continuing this conversation and any input on where that should happen. So first, yes. what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So just a quick show of hands. How many people think this was useful and we should try to have this more often? Let's see, like 50%? All right. So. A challenge, right, is uh, we've also heard from many organizations that have had this discussion more locally. Um, you know, the CNC started a discussion in France, CST is involved, and um, FICAM is involved. Uh, um, you know, folks uh, in Sweden did something slightly different. CMT is working on it. ISO is working on it. And so how do we, how do we pick the right place for all of us to come together and try to find some commonality uh, you know, understand what we're working towards and try to uh, put together these, uh, at least, if not standards, but at least these best practices together. Is this, uh, is this a formal organization like ISO? Is it uh, something less formal? Yes? There's a meeting tomorrow. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. so I'd hate to toot my own horn. I mean, we, it could be the IMF user group, but I'm really, really asking this group. Yes, John. So two things. One, I think the IMF short term for people in this room who are new to the IMF UG, um, there's a list of vendors who are on the uh, IBC floor who will support IMF and if you want to learn more about it, please go to the IMF UG website, look at the list of vendors and go visit uh, to talk about IMF uh, if you will uh, do you a favor. Yeah. yeah, so IBC is a great time to learn. And so back to you, so how would this, so uh, CNC is working on this, so how do we coordinate all this? I think there are uh, several issues. Of course, uh, I think uh, no one from us has the time to be in uh, 20 different groups. I think uh, that's the issue. And uh, of course, uh, he can also not uh, be physically uh, at each meeting. So for me, the question would be uh, if there uh, an online way, uh, online forum would make sense to discuss topics and uh, to address this. Because uh, I have heard many things today, and I think it was very interesting, a lot of different views. Uh, uh, but at the end, of course, this has to be a little bit uh, harmonized or focused, so to address the real questions and uh, also to, to uh, decide uh, the strategy in which way we want to go forward. Maybe uh, at the end we will have uh, still several groups, but I think the most important topic is really to be informed of uh, what's going on uh, and what the others are doing. And I think that's the most important topic. And hopefully we find a, a 
an online forum or a blog or whatever choose yeah Yes, so, but I mean, the question directly is, does anybody know of an existing forum? Because, like, let's not duplicate an effort in an effort, in an effort to not duplicate efforts, right? So, <laughs> should be the irony. I mean, is there such a forum today where, you know, archivists, preservationists, media folks actually get together already? All right. Is so I, I would actually agree with that because I, I deal with EMEA a lot, and um, and I've been working with SIMTI, working with EMEA, and I can see where a group like this, where you know production and distribution is focused here, um, have the conversation with EMEA, which is small, medium, and large uh, cultural and moving image archives that are not anywhere close to the size that we are and that most of the folks in this room are. Um, and also our funding challenge because they have some very specific needs. I think bringing in the different groups, you know, even like IASA and FIAF on the odd occasion, I think talking to each of the groups that have moving image content archive participation makes sense because at the very least, getting the feedback on the archival aspects that are under discussion in IMF and at least getting their opinions on what, what we as a group are working on could be very valuable. Mm -hmm. Yes, and So the Academy, uh, as you know, is active in this area, but certainly from a uh, theatrical motion picture point of view, even though in our archive we have holdings from a television show, actually one television show in, in particular, but we do have a section of ASA Central that is targeted for archival applications that want to get more attention <coughs> now that we have a specification and we do have some other work underway that I think is complementary, and we're happy to cross-promote because there are obviously other applications besides the actual motion pictures for archiving. Uh, so we're we're here to help where we can. Yes. I just, I'm not saying I'm not saying this is the answer. I'm just in in the, in, the, in the DPP process that that helped to transform uh, you know, from physical tapes to file delivery very quickly. It was sort of all the broadcasters and the manufacturers got together. So uh, that that forum where you've got broadcast and manufacturers sitting together in terms of defining what the problem in space yeah. is and you know, f you know targeting then resource and and the answers to that so was it manufacturers were tar targeting resource and and the business was then t s s defining what the, 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 the effectively the problem space and the and the, some of the metadata standards that that would be that would be a very a useful not let's say a, a, a useful sort of general sort of general approach and so do you think, I mean, for those folks that are, uh, because I heard EMEA a number of times that are involved in that group, in, is that group interested in that kind of uh, setting up that kind of effort or are they looking for another group to do that with their no, participation? I, I, can, I can tell you right now, having dealt with them, they are looking to have these conversations. In fact, I'm doing a presentation on exactly right. this issue in November in Baltimore at the annual conference. So yes, they are looking for um, ways to have conversations with people because in the end, the folks who, who work or deal with EMEA are going to be dealing with a lot of the content that the folks in this room are going to generate over the next 30 years. They're going to be dealing with that. And so they are looking to have those conversations, um, you know, especially because they are resource constricted. And so folks like us who aren't as resource constricted, um, we can start those conversations and get them thinking about the issues that this new format brings to the table. And they can also feedback on us. Uh, and this is why at the library we found EMEA very valuable. Uh, we've gotten feedback from folks. We know what our challenges and our collections are, but there's plenty of other folks with plenty of other disparate formats out there, esoteric formats there. And so from a long-term preservation uh, and repurposing perspective, they, they have given us valuable technical and practical feedback on what is involved in preserving older content on esoteric formats that we can then learn from and either not make the same mistakes with things like IMF in the future, or what happens if that content needs to end up in an IMF at some point. So uh, still what I'm missing a little bit is a, a kind of, uh, let's say, central information platform to keep uh, 
all people informed about this topic. Uh, I'm not sure how we can manage this, I have to say. Uh, but uh, at, at least uh, from my uh, project, Send Package Preservation, I would like to share this information uh, on a central platform, give progress reports or whatever. Uh, of course, I can offer also a, a, a within this project a, a platform, but then you have to manage all of this uh, different information points. And maybe uh, still the question is if the IMF user group can collect or uh, be such kind of central information point. Well, as, um, as, Steve, as Steve Lamb pointed out a few seconds ago, it, it, the group happens to have a plenary meeting tomorrow, so that could be discussed. Yeah. I mean, so, um, and the idea is, would be to just have a central point for digital archive coordination, essentially. Yeah. Digital archive and, all right. Any thoughts on that? Would that be useful? I mean, I, I think I'll tr reach out to you to find the right people and EMEA to make sure they're, you know, they think it's a, not a terrible idea, so. They have a, especially if they have a long-term plan, right? <laughs> um, any other thoughts on that topic? I mean, this is really the opportunity for folks that have a strong opinion or f that have experience on this to really share it with the rest of us. I mean, this is a really unique event. Yes? Well, I don't think maybe it seems like a pretty successful meeting here. And it's connected to um, the IDC more or less. I don't know if you'd be willing to do something in a year or two. Um. Yeah, so we could certainly plan on doing it uh, again in a year and see where we've been. I mean, that that could be a good, a good concrete step. Yeah. Right. So, so for yeah, so maybe that's a good time to mention. So for those folks that couldn't make it here or that want to do learn more and may, maybe uh, meet a slightly different uh, facet of the problem, we have a sister event in October in Los Angeles on October twenty fifth, just around the SMT annual technical conference. Um, I think it will be focused a little bit more on preservation of the output of the production process. So you know, the source, digital source master. Um, so that's, um, and I expect I'll have a similar format to this, um, but we could certainly uh, look at um, doing this regularly. Yes. Wow, I've uh, I've rarely seen such a consensus in a meeting. <laughs> um. <laughs> so I mean, s <laughs> um, well, we could certainly um, certainly make you know try to aim to meet again in a year and gauge the progress we've made electronically and through the meet through what we were going to do in October. I mean, that and we can always meet earlier. And, and maybe have an online component, not only reflecting the output of these two meetings, yeah, yeah. but maybe if there's a, a way to do a forum yeah. where people can come together, maybe on a regular basis online, to have discussions, to pose questions. Yeah, that's what that we're might be about. the way to do it right. instead of physical in, in person. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I also would appreciate this because I, I also wrote down uh, uh, some questions, so, and I would like to put this in such kind of forum and uh, to start such kind of discussions, but of course we need an online forum for this. All right, and so basically it's the intersection, tr I'm trying to summarize it in my own mind, so it's the intersection of archiving and really the realities of modern production, essentially. Is that a fair, trying, is a fair way of stating the scope? All right, and okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So I'll be, I mean, I'll be reaching on a few of you to make sure I get the right folks, you know, and while we have C, uh, Sank, how do you pronounce it? The group C and C and C or? C or C N. All right. C. There's no C at the end. No, I know, but I thought it was C N C. Anyway, C N. Um, all right. So. Um,
we'll put that on the agenda. Um, again, um, any last minute thoughts before we call it a day and take the ferry or not? All right. Well, again, thank you very much for everybody. Thank you. F oh, oh. As I totally missed you, Walter. I don't know. <laughs> And uh, thanks again uh, very much to all of our speakers, to Deluxe for sponsoring uh, the refreshments, and uh, to Olaf, uh, Fabian, and Stefan for their amazing job that hopefully we'll see results of uh, very shortly. So thank you again very much. Thank you, Siegfried, and a good hand to everybody.